with a roll call. With a roll call. Um, so uh, when I'm going to ask, I'm going to um, say your name and please respond. Um, Arson Karinian. Hillary Calais. Yes, present. Jesus Martinez. Happy to be here, present. Okay. Lindsay Krolik. Hi there, uh, present. Hi. And please let me know if I am not pronouncing your name correctly. Michael Isari. Present. Oliver Unaka. I'm here. Thank you. Robert um, Hershenson. I'm here. Ryan Davis. Here. Smita Rajmohan. Present. Smita. Smita. Great. Okay. Is Mariah Jaworski present? As well as Suyin Choi. Arson Karinian is present. Had an issue with my link. Hi, Arson. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. We have now completed the roll call. And uh, we're going to note for everyone present that a Zoom meeting, like a regular in person meeting of the Privacy Law Group, is recorded and it will be archived on the State Bar's website. Oh. Uh, we're going to, the Privacy Law Group is going to take items of the agenda in the order that they appear on the agenda. Okay. Um, at this time, we're going to ask the Privacy Law Group to introduce themselves. And um, as we go through and, uh, and introduce themselves, please um, say a quick um, hello and a description of your practice and uh, your interest in this, participating in the consulting group. Janelle, would you announce the name of the member to be introduced? Arsen Kirian. Hi, I'm Arsene Karinian. I'm a partner at Mayor Brown in the Cyber and Data Privacy Group. Um, and I advise clients on compliance with global and domestic data privacy laws and security issues. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this board and um, improving the state of privacy in the United States, including California, and creating a privacy specialization, specialization for this evolving field. Thank you, Hillary Calais. Hi, I'm Hillary Calais. I am principal counsel at the University of California Office of the President. Part of my role is advising on uh, data privacy, both within uh, for our campuses, for students and employees, and for the medical centers for patients. Um, I have. Um, I also advise on GDPR, international laws. Um, I only recently, I guess in the past six years, um, became interested in privacy. Um, um, since then, I've expanded my practice. And, you know, given, given the um, constitutional right to privacy in California, which is something that's incredibly rare um, nationally, I think um, it's, you know, I think it's, you know, important that we, that as a state, um, we evaluate it um, not only in importance of the laws, but in importance of the lawyers practicing. So I am very happy to be here. Thank you. Vaughn Sirocco. Hi, uh, thank you, Janelle. Um, I'm Joanne Serrato. I'm a partner in the San Francisco office of Baker Hassettler. Uh, before joining Baker Hassettler, I served as a legislative counsel to the U.S. House of Representatives and also as an advisory council member to the, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, I also served as inaugural chair of the California Lawyers Association, a privacy law section, um, as the privacy law section was established uh, two years ago. Um, I my practice is uh, mainly focused on privacy and cybersecurity, and we help uh, businesses comply with laws um, that are uh, regulating the collection and use of personal data. Um, as uh, the California State uh, Bar is considering uh, the specialization, I think it is um, uh, it's helpful to note that other states have gone ahead. Uh, we're gonna be discussing that today, um, what other states efforts have been 
to create a specialization in California, and I'm very excited and honored to be serving as chair for this consulting group. Thank you, Jesus Martinez. Let's see, good morning. I'm Jesus Martinez, and I already feel underqualified to be on this panel just based on the introductions we've had. <laughs> I am the general counsel for a technology company, Social Next America, which is based in Milpitas, California. Uh, for the past 20 years, I've been representing technology companies here in Silicon Valley, and privacy has always been a personal interest, but I decided to make it a professional interest and I became certified through IAPP as a CIP. I think it's CIPP US. I'm happy to be on the panel and I hope I can contribute in a meaningful way. Thank you. Lindsay Krolik. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Krolik. I am a professor at Santa Clara University School of Law. Um, and I also maintain a private practice um, focused mainly on privacy. Um, I've worked in-house um, at a variety of companies in Silicon Valley for the last 20 years um, and try to bring a lot of practical um, real life experience to my now students. I'm very interested in uh, and excited to be participating in this working group um, to provide you know, a path for students who are interested in privacy to begin getting um, a real solid foundation um, that they can begin their practices with, as well as to provide the more senior lawyers um, recognition of, of where they're at. Um, I'm also particularly interested in the uh, intersection of data privacy and ethics. Thank you, Michael Isseri. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Isseri. And I'm an attorney and software engineer. I specialize in technology law and specifically in disability rights and accessibility. For the past six years, I actually programmed one of the leading AI programs that's fully voiced in 45 languages and dynamically completes any legal and non-legal services. I also have one of the leading fully voiced maps database systems for homeless resources and natural disasters throughout California. I was previously heavily certified in cybersecurity in networks. Um, that was before law school and unfortunately law school kind of took into its effect and I couldn't renew my licenses. I was originally on the Community of Bar Examiners, which I know most of the um, California State Bar employees, so hello again. And I well, am a former person from the Center for Accessible Technology and currently, I am actually was appointed by ABS Access to Justice Committee. So I'm serving on that for probably this year and maybe another year at still waiting for renewal. And last I'll mention is um, I have, I've been uh, certified by Google as a unicorn. So I'm looking forward to providing my specialties and expertise in terms of this exciting new legal specialization community. So I'm greatly honored to be on it. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver Yunaka. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Yunaka. Um, my background, and I'll be very brief, has been in corporate uh, communications. So I've been in corporate, a little bit of marketing communications for the past 25 years. I've worked with some of the leading companies who had um, largest uh, database of medical records, et cetera. For those of you who are familiar, um, the uh, company that was out in the Midwest, uh, they housed that information and they were a leading company. And uh, this was probably 10, 15 years ago. So we were grappling with this topic even then. Um, just really happy to be here and uh, look forward to working with you all and getting to know you all very, very well. Thank you. Paul Anenos. Paul Anenos. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Paul Anenos. I'm happy to, uh, happy to be here. Um, so I am a director at the European Law Firm for Fisher, which is based in the uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, I also uh, teach privacy compliance law at the uh, University of California Hastings Law School, uh, which is now known as uh, University of California College of the Law in San Francisco. 
uh, before uh, joining uh, to Fisher, I was working uh, internationally. I was vice president and senior legal counsel at a large international bank uh, located in Switzerland. I also worked at the bank Hong Kong's office. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, I advise clients in relation to uh, privacy, data protection, and cybersecurity law. Uh, so I am really honored to be on this working group and I'm happy to help in any way. Thank you, Robert Hershenson. Hey, good morning, everybody. So I'm Robert Hershenson. I uh, am a public member of uh, of this group. Um, I uh, got involved. I previously served on the California Board of Legal Specialization, CBLS, from uh, 2017 to 2021. Uh, and uh, I'm an IT professional. I work for a company called Western Jet Aviation uh, at the Van Nuys Airport. We do maintenance, repair, overhaul on, on corporate jets. Uh, and I run our IT group here. Thank you, Ryan Davis. Hi, my name is Ryan Davis and I've worked in privacy for about 10 years. I worked as a director for UC Davis Health in their compliance department. Uh, prior to coming to UC Davis Health, I worked at the Department of Corrections and the California Department of Public Health as their chief privacy officer and privacy attorney. Um, and there I've worked on regulations and legislation uh, in the privacy space. I'm really excited for the formation of the PLG because of all of the complexity of privacy laws here in California. And I think we could really benefit from some privacy specialization standards. I'm really excited to be here and work with you all. Thank you. Samita Rajmohan. Hi, everybody. I'm Smita Rajmohan. Um, I'm a senior product counsel at Autodesk, where I lead the legal team's machine learning platform strategy, um, AI and data ethics governance, and support for everything that is related to generative artificial intelligence. Um, I also counsel my team on data privacy, licensing, and other intellectual property matters. Um, before that, I was a, a product counsel at Apple, um, advising on um, hardware products and machine learning. Um, I serve on the Education Advisory Board for the IAPP and on the board of my alma mater, Berkeley Law, Go Bears. Um, I'm a frequent speaker on data privacy, AI, and technology issues. Um, I'm a part of the teaching faculty at Practicing Law Institute and a fre frequent um, guest lecturer at Berkeley Law. Um, I'm very excited about joining this team because I think um, having a specialization in privacy law is also going to encourage interest in privacy law um, and encourage young practitioners to pursue this um, very worthy um, specialization and field. So thank you for having me and I really look forward to working with all of you. I'll go ahead and start off the introductions for State Bar staff. My name is Janelle Delacruz. I am the program analyst as well as a program coordinator for the Department of Legal Specialization. And I am excited to see what happens with this group. Adrian. Would you okay. <laughs> uh, Adrian Galang. Um, hi, everyone. I know I. We started out uh, when we established this group, I was uh, communicating with uh, uh, most of you. Um, I am the program supervisor with the legal specialization unit here at the State Bar of California. Uh, I provide uh, direct support, administrative support to the California Board of Legal Specialization. Um, and I'm really excited. Uh, I think maybe outside of uh, attorneys, I'm probably the most excited about uh, possibly adding this uh, this legal specialty area to the State Bar of California. So uh, look forward to uh, working with you all and um, uh, seeing the outcome of this work. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Ching, the Assistant Director of the Office of Admissions. I work with Adrian and Janelle and the rest of the legal specialization team. And um, I will also say I'm very excited. We're, it's a theme. We're all excited to see where this goes. So thank you all so much. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Nunez. I'm the director of the Office of Admissions. And like everyone else, I'm excited. Um, and you know, I'm gonna get into the strategic plan, but um, how this will fit into the overall context is very um, 
uh, of what we're trying to do in the Office of Admissions is of a big interest of mine as well. So thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. I am Jean Kristolnikoff. I am with the State Bar's Office of General Counsel, um, and I support admissions. And within that, um, I also support CBLS and now this group. Um, so I'm just here to support you in your works. So if you have questions about anything, of course, feel free to reach out. Well, Jean, we have one question and Janelle saw me email her. I was asking about this fancy background. I like yours the best, but I see now it's reserved for team members. <laughs> I think we will circulate those um, so that you can use them and have a fancy background too. I have the, the most up-to-date version, um, but you'll have a few to choose from. So, but thank you for the softball question. You got it. All right, does that uh, conclude the staff uh, introductions, Janelle? Yes, it does. All right, did you want me to go through the administrative reminders before we start with the open session or um, will you be doing that? Go ahead and start with uh, 1B, uh, injection for public comment. Okay, uh, well, before we do that, um, I think um, I it's my job to remind everyone to turn off your phones and uh, put the computers on mute uh, while not speaking. Um, and uh, we're going to, uh, we uh, hopefully should have gotten a copy of the agenda um, and also um, to, uh, to, we will be having a break in the middle of the day. So we'll clearly announce when the recording is going to stop and where it has resumed. So with that, we're going to start with the instructions for co public comment. And um, so uh, uh, bear with me here. The Board of Trustees recently adopted a public comment policy that applies to all state bar committees, including this one. Its policy statement says the State Bar of California welcomes public comment at all of its public meetings and appreciates listening to a wide range of viewpoints that reflect the diversity of California. Those public comment rules are designed to ensure that members of the public may exercise their right to be heard, as well as ensure that the state bar is able to fulfill its obligation to conduct public business on behalf of the people of California in a timely fashion. Written public comment may be submitted to the email address on the meeting agenda. We encourage you to submit written public comment at least 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting. Written comments received less than 24 hours prior to the start of a meeting will be distributed the following business day. If you bring written materials to a meeting for distribution, they will be collected by the meeting secretary and distributed after the meeting concludes. For oral public comments, persons were encouraged to sign up to speak in advance of the meeting and will be called in the order they have signed up. Persons attending the meeting remotely will be called in the order that they appear in the attendee list. And in a moment, I'll explain how to raise your hand to tell us that you want to do that. Those joining us in the room today wishing to make a public comment may sign up on a signage sheet that was available um, outside of the entrance to our meeting room. Of course, that does not apply here because we're meeting virtually. Speakers cannot cede their time to another speaker. It does not guarantee that all who wish to speak will be able to do so to facilitate hearing from as many members as possible. We encourage you not to repeat points that were made by previous speakers. Simply say that you agree with them to allow the committee the time needed to deliberate on the important topics that we'll be discussing today. We'll be limiting public comments to three minutes per person. As a reminder, the state bar's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy says, the state bar maintains zero tolerance for unlawful harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. Employees must at all times treat all other employees, job applicants, and persons providing services to the state bar with respect and dignity in accordance with this policy. Likewise, the state bar will not tolerate harassment, discrimination, or retaliation against its employees, job applicants, or members of the public by any employees or by any person with whom the state bar has a business service or a professional relationship. If you're in Zoom and want to speak, you'll need to raise your hand unless you are already in the pre-meeting signup list. To do so, you click on the hand icon that's at the bottom center of your Zoom window. 
If you're participating by telephone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's the star key and then the number nine. Our coordinator will call members of the public starting with the pre signups, then the Zoom list, followed by in person signups in the order that they raised their hands or signed up. Staff will enable the microphone of the speaker, start the timer, and then call out when 30 seconds remain. At this time, I will ask do we have anyone that wishes to make comments? Seeing none, I believe we do not have any other planned guests. So at this point, I would like to turn over to Amy Nunes for the report on the State Bar Strategic Plan. Thank you, Chiwan. Hello, everyone. Uh, we have a PowerPoint that we'll be presenting um, as part of um, the session. And as I mentioned before, I think learning about um, the State Bar Strategic Plan, the five-year plan, uh, will provide some overall context on how a privacy law specialization um, can fit into uh, this plan. So with that, uh, we'll start the uh, next slide, please. So uh, we have our strategic plan. Uh, it's a five-year plan, um, and it was adopted by the Board of Trustees in May of 2022, and it reflects the organization's vision um, for realizing uh, this uh, mission um, over the next five years. And it's grounded on the state's uh, State Bar's mission uh, to uh, protect the public by strengthening the attorney discipline system, improving access and inclusion in the legal system, regulating the legal profession, and engaging partners. And so I'll cover the four areas and highlight to you uh, which of the goals is more relevant for the initiative that we're discussing here today. So uh, starting with goal one, um, next screen. Uh, the first goal of the strategic plan is to protect the public by strengthening the attorney discipline system. Uh, this has a less relevance to what is being discussed, but just to give you an idea, uh, we're, we, this is the um, vision is that the state bar discipline system is and is recognized as effective, fair, and timely. Um, next slide, please. And these are the um, strategies for uh, achieving that goal. So it incorporates um, uh, adopting a new case processing standard of improving operational practice to focus resources on uh, resolving disciplinary cases. It has a consumer uh, focus um, that is assisting the public in navigating the complaint process and seeking fair, appropriate, and timely resolution. Uh, as for the diversity, equity, and inclusion aspect of this strategy. Um, it's uh, the strategy is to continue to address any racial, other dis uh, disparities in the attorney discipline system. And lastly, in terms of uh, the policy and systems change, it's, uh, the goal is to uh, respond to emerging issues regarding attorney's misconduct and to promote solutions to increase public protection. Uh, next slide, please. So here in goal two, um, this has uh, more relevance uh, to uh, a, what a privacy a law specialization bring. And here, the vision is that all California residents have access to high quality, affordable, and cultural competent uh, legal advice and services. Uh, the second goal is about protecting the public by enhancing access to inclusion in the legal system by increasing access to the legal system through public outreach and education, improved access and legal advice and services, and a legal profession that uh, reflects diversity in the California community. And these are the strategies um, please, for achieving these goals. So under effectiveness, we have increased representation through the state bar's existing regulatory and oversight authority including special admissions and pro bono practice programs. For the consumer focus, here it's to increase public education, outreach, and awareness to close the knowledge gap and connect consumers to relevant and legal resources. And I think this has a very um, a, a big correlation with what the privacy law um, specialization could achieve. Part of that is um, uh, under the consumer focus, the thought is to um, provide better understanding of the knowledge gap and develop strategies 
to address the barriers that consumers face in securing legal advice. Um, and we know that uh, without a privacy law um, specialization that uh, consumers right now have to um, uh, you know, uh, find that and identify it for themselves. Uh, consumer focus also includes keeping abreast of the legal services market and how the changes in the market impact individual consumers. Uh, next, we also have an, a, another strategy under the school uh, that addresses diversity, equity, and inclusion is, um, uh, has less relevance uh, to this privacy law group, but it's to support the law school uh, to, profession, uh, to profession pipeline to, uh, to foster diverse legal profession representative of California's community, particularly as related to race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. And as, uh, as far as the policy and systems change, here it's to identify and advocate for innovative policy and regulatory reforms needed to increase access to legal services, particularly by disenfranchised, underserved, and rural communities. The next goal uh, has to do with um, protecting the public by regulating the legal profession of promoting the, uh, the ethical and competent practice of law, preventing misconduct by providing education, resources, and support for the legal profession. And the vision here is that state bar licensees exemplify excellence and personal responsibility in the practice of law. So uh, these strategies here on member effectiveness is to use data to identify attorney, attorneys most at risk of misconduct Points and to develop the resources and supports needed to prevent misconduct. As for the consumer focus, here it's to develop and deploy self-assessment modules, minimum continuing legal education, uh, practice tools, and other resources to support attorneys in the continued education, professional development, and the competent practice of law. And um, within the consumer focus, it's also to provide effective support for attorneys experiencing practice management and other challenges that affect competency, and, um, and also to create a licensee resource page on our state bar website to provide information and tools on emerging topics and issues, including mental health, financial literacy, and navigating imposter syndrome in the workplace. Um, also, as part of um, the work that's carried out by uh, the legal specialization staff, for um, we have a legal specialization newsletter um, that can provide support and resources to specialists. Um, and uh, if we ever, uh, if, if and when we develop a privacy law specialization, um, that newsletter uh, could be um, a method for um, providing support to other specialists that might have this common interest. Uh, also, uh, under the, the next strategy, under goal three, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the idea is to support retention, development, and advancement of a diverse legal profession with a focus on preventative, preventative measures to address disproportionate complaints and uh, discipline rates. And as for the policy and systems change, it's to explore and implement regulations to to, uh, to address and deter actions that pose significant harm, uh, risks of, of public harm. And the last goal here, and the fourth is to protect the public by engaging partners and stakeholders to enhance public protection and restore the state bar's credibility, reputation, and impact. The vision here is that partner and stakeholders are actively involved in and supportive of the of state bars public protection initiatives, achievements, programs, and services. Some of the strategies here are uh, in terms of effectiveness is to increase public trust and consumer awareness by demonstrating competence, consistency, and transparency. As for the consumer focus, it's to establish collaborative relationships with community and consumer facing organizations and engage partners in collaborative work, work groups, uh, which is very relevant to uh, what we're trying to accomplish here today. As for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, strategy to address that is ensuring that communication materials and resources are accessible to California's diverse communities. 
And lastly, as for the policy and systems change um, in, uh, within this goal is to partner with stakeholders to increase protection and attorney regulation through legislation and policy change. And so uh, with that, you know, I want, I want to know, does anybody have any questions about um, the strategic plan and uh, how some of this context um, is uh, really relevant to uh, what this privacy and law group uh, could accomplish? Any thoughts? Okay. All right, then with that, I will hand it back to you, Dion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, next, um, we're going to ask Jean to provide the orientation on the Rosenberg's Rules of Order and other recent revisions to the Board of Trustees Policy Manual. Jean? Hi, everyone. Janelle, can you pull up the PowerPoint when you get a chance? Um, so for those of you who are serving on a state bar, um, Sub entity for the first time, um, we thought it would be really helpful to go over some recent revisions that were made to the Board of Trustees Policy Manual, which relate to um, public meetings. Um, and just as background, um, our meetings are governed by Bagley Keene, which is the Open Meetings Act, and we can um, train on that at another point in time, but we wanted to just uh, provide this background to you so that you understand um, kind of the rules of the road for our meetings going forward. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so until recently, the Board of Trustees used Robert's Rules of Order as a guide in conducting our meetings, but recently the Board of Trustees and um, adopted a um, policy that the board and sub entities will use Rosenberg's rules of order as a guide when conducting meetings. Um, and so Rosenberg's rules of order, if you're not familiar, um, you can Google it, it'll pull up a 10 page document. It's very, very simple. If you've seen Robert's rules of order before, it's a two inch thick book. So um, this is, uh, it should make for a much easier time in understanding the rules for our meetings. Um, and as I just mentioned, we are subject to Bagley Keene. So to the extent Rosenberg's rules of order conflict with Bagley Keene um, or other state law, state law, of course, will control. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just an overview of the rules. Um, you know, we took a roll call vote earlier today, and that was to establish quorum, which is a majority of the members um, of the body. Um, Rosenberg's rules are a little bit different when it comes to the role of the chair. The chair is responsible for applying the rules of conduct. They have a right to participate in decision making, but should strive to be the last person to speak at the discussion and debate stage. And generally, the chair should not make or second a motion unless no other member of the body will um, do so at that point in time. Um, and then we discussed the meeting format, the chair, you guys are doing a great job so far. Uh, the chair announces the agenda item, number and name. They invite the presenters to report the item. The chair asks the members if they have any questions of clarification. Um, uh, and I'll talk about public comment in a moment. The chair invites a motion and announces the name of the member who makes the motion. Next slide, please. Um, the chair then determines if any member wishes to second the motion and announces the name of the second. Um, once the chair makes sure everybody understands the motion, um, they invite discussion. Um, and once discussion has concluded, the body votes on the motion. Um, if there's been substantial discussion, it's a good practice to repeat the motion just so that everybody knows what they're voting on. Then we take the roll call vote, um, which is required under Bagley Keene when we have a teleconference meeting. Um, and then the chair announces the results of the vote. And so um, just as a general matter, what this helps do is um, signpost for us as we go through a meeting and makes clear to the public what it is that we are, and to the members of the group, what it is that we are doing, where we are in the process. And one of the big changes, um, next slide please, Janelle. One of the big differences between um, Rosenberg's rules and rules that um, I've seen employed at other bodies is that generally you put the motion on the floor before discussion so that the discussion is focused. Um, and so that is a change that everybody is trying to get used to. And I will say we have not perfected it yet, but it's something that we're striving to do. 
So motions in general, um, this is what I was just talking about. It's best practice to have the motion before the discussion to help the body focus. Motions are made in a two-step process. The chair recognizes the member wishing to make the motion, and then the member states the motion. Um, motions can be initiated in one of three ways. The chair invites members of the body to make a motion, the chair suggests a motion, or, or the chair can make a motion. Next slide, please. Um, these are the three types of basic motions. Um, the basic, the first one is the basic motion, puts forward a decision for the body's consideration. So an example, I move that we create a five member subcommittee to plan our annual fundraiser. Um, a motion to amend, so if a member wants to change the basic motion. Uh, and a substitute motion is when a member wants to completely do away with the basic motion and put a new motion before the body. Um, a friendly amendment is one um, that uh, is, is just basically um, a slight change to the motion. Um, and it seems that the change is desirable to the body during the discussion. There can be up to three motions on the floor at the same time. The vote proceeds in reverse order, beginning with the last motion that was made. Um, I, I understand that can get a little complicated. Generally speaking, I'll say we, we, we haven't seen three motions on the floor at any one time, but we will muddle through it if and when that happens. Next slide, please. Other motions, um, these are all prescribed by Rosenberg's Rules of Order. Um, as I mentioned, we are using this as a guide. So this is not, um, you know, it's not strictly required. And in fact, the practice at the state bar has not to require, has been not to require a motion to adjourn. So we actually don't even need to make that motion today when we're, when we conclude our business, so long as, um, you know, there isn't, there isn't a reason to force adjournment. Um, other motions that we may have are a motion to recess, a motion to fix the time to adjourn, a motion to table an item, a motion to limit debate, uh, or a motion to reconsider. Um, and one thing to note is that present and voting, in determining whether a motion passes, we count all votes that are present and voting and we do not count abstentions. Um, next slide, please. Courtesy and decorum. Um, these are just um, some common sense rules. So it's best practice for one speaker to have the floor and for each speaker to be recognized by the chair before proceeding to speak. The chair should ensure the discussion of an agenda item is focused on that item. Um, and interruptions of a speaker are generally limited to a point of privilege, a point of order, to appeal a ruling of the chair, calls for order of the day, or to withdraw a motion. Next slide, please. Public input. In addition to following the procedures that we've talked about, the chair um, should, with respect to each agenda item, tell the public what the body will be doing, keep the public informed while the body is doing it, and when the body has acted, tell the public what the body did. And so again, that is just the signposting what we're doing as we go along. Next slide, please. Um, so I promise to come back to public comment policy, and here we are. Um, in addition to adopting Rosenberg's rules of order, we have also adopted a public comment policy um, that applies to the board and to all sub entities, including this group. Um, and the policy statement, um, you actually heard it before. Um, it is the State Bar of California welcomes public comment at all of its public meetings and appreciates listening to a wide range of viewpoints that reflect the diversity of California. These public comment rules are designed to ensure that members of the public may exercise their right to be heard, as well as ensure that the state State Bar is able to fulfill its obligation to conduct business on behalf of the people of California in a timely fashion. Um, and so the public po comment policy, um, the, the purpose of this was to ensure that um, our public policy, excuse me, our public comment policies um, are effective in ensuring that the public can be heard and to clarify the rules um, about public comment and to make it more accessible to the public. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to oral public comment, um, the public is uh, encouraged to make written public comment in advance of meetings, which is then distributed to the body. Um, this, well, this is all set forth in the agenda online, so people can revisit this um, if, if they have any questions about how to submit public written public comment. Um, next slide, please. Um, oral public comment, we also now have a procedure whereby members of the public can sign up to speak in advance of the meeting, and that way they will be called in the order they signed up. Um, and we, since we are um, attending remotely, if 
uh, members of the public are attending remotely. They'll be called in order they appear. Um, for all of our sub entities, the chair sets a time per speaker, but that time cannot be less than two minutes per speaker. Um, the time limit is the same for all speakers and you can't cede your time to another speaker. Um, and there are just some, um, some guidance on spokespersons for groups here as well. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just the limits of, of public com comment. Um, I, I don't think that we will um, encounter this, but in case we do, um, the chair is allowed to reopen public comment at, in their discretion. Um, it's not guaranteed that everyone who wishes to speak will be able to do so. And the time allotted for public comment will vary according to the number of requests received and the time available. Um, this is the part that I think probably won't come up, but we'll, we'll deal with it if we do. After two hours of public comment, inclusive of a 10 minute break or up to the first hundred speakers, whichever comes first, the chair may declare that the public comment session is closed so that the body can proceed with its other business. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, um, we also want to ensure that our meetings are accessible and we have a process in place. So if anybody requires a reasonable accommodation that we can uh, make those accommodations in advance of the meeting um, to ensure that we can get the logistics in place, we request three business days uh, notice. Um, and just with respect to public comment, public speakers who require an interpreter get twice the time of other speakers. Um, and the granting of additional time for speakers who require other accommodations is at the discretion of the chair. Um, but of course, it must be sufficient to afford the speaker equal access. Next slide, please. Uh, maintaining decorum at the meetings. Um, speakers are given broad latitude in their public comments, so long as the comments relate to matters under the jurisdiction of the body. Um, members of the public do have the right to criticize the state bar's programs, policies, and services, as well as its officers and staff. Um, however, members of the public who engage in conduct that disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the meeting shall, at the discretion of the chair, be barred from further audience before the body at the meeting. Um, also, the state bar has a policy against discrimination and harassment. In the event of discriminatory or harassing comments during public comment, the there's a process that we can, may follow, um, and this is within the chair's discretion. But first, the uh, chair can read the state bar's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy into the record. Next slide, please, Janelle. Um, state that the comment state that comments in violation of the state bar's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy will not be condoned and are unwelcome or inappropriate and interfere with the ability of those present to listen and understand. The chair can state that any state bar employee who is offended or otherwise does not wish to attend due to the remarks is excused from attendance at the meeting during the remarks. The speaker's time is held during the chair's admonishment and the speaker will receive their full allotment of time unless the comments disrupt, disturb, or otherwise impede the orderly conduct of the meeting. Um, the speaker is allowed to continue their comments after the admonishment and the chair may call a recess to allow staff or members of the public to leave or provide de-escalation. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, there are other uh, decorum matters to just be considerate of and um, in-person attendees, we have some rules about obstructing the view. Um, in the event of an emergency, of course, the state bar may waive or override the rules pertaining to meeting decorum. Um, and comments or and materials received during public comment will in full become part of the public record. And that is true of both uh, written comment that is submitted um, as well as oral comment. Um, and as you know, these meetings are recorded and posted to the website. So the public comments um, are also recorded and are included on our website as part of the full recording. Next slide, please. This is the state bar's anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. Um, so in the event that we were, um, there was a, a reason for it to be read into the record, this is the text of it for all of you to see. Um, and with that, my presentation is concluded. Thanks very much, Jean. Of course. That concludes items um, 2A and B, the staff report portion of this meeting. And we will now be moving on to items uh, 3A, uh, the business uh, part of this meeting. Um, and before we begin with the discussion regarding the current state of privacy law, uh, which Ryan and I will lead, uh, we the State Bar thought that it would be helpful to hear uh, from our guest speaker. So uh, Brian Oten is the Director of Specialty 
Community uh, with the North Carolina State Bar. And uh, Brian is going to present to us um, the, the North Carolina perspective in terms of how the state went about establishing a legal specialty in privacy. Brian? Brian isn't scheduled until 11.30 due okay. to our agenda. Can we go ahead and move into business? We can go ahead and do that. Um, it sounds like we were fast in our staff report, uh, so we can go ahead and get started um, with, with my portion of it, uh, which is to start uh, talking about the current state of privacy law. So if Janelle, if you could start with the presentation. All right, so I'm just looking at the clock. So it sounds like uh, we will have our guest speaker come online um, in 40 minutes. So uh, if you could let us know, uh, Janelle, when Brian is online uh, for the meeting, we will take a break and uh, we will resume our discussion. So, um, so uh, first of all, um, I am really um, uh, deeply appreciative of the consulting group um, that we'll be working together uh, to discuss and to respond to the questions that the State Bar is posing. And we thought that it would be helpful to, uh, to start with the purpose um, as this consulting group was being um, established. And you heard uh, from our staff reports first, uh, the strategic plan and also uh, the rules um, of order in terms of how we're going to go about conducting the business. So please keep those in mind as we are beginning uh, the consultation and uh, keep the strategic plan in mind that Amy uh, presented to us and also the rules of order in terms of how to engage. Um, but specifically for this consulting group, this is the purpose um, that the State Bar has uh, asked us to focus. So the consulting group on the establishment of a legal specialization is tasked with studying the practice area to assess whether there is sufficient need and interest to create a specialty as well as whether the area is sufficiently defined as to create a useful specialization. If the privacy law group determines that the certification in this area of law is feasible and appropriate, then we will be drafting the appropriate certification standards for review uh, by the California Board of Legal Specialization and the State Bar Board of Trustees. So that's the, the purpose um, that is given to us for this consulting group. Any questions there? If not, we'll go to next, the assessment questions. Uh, so we thought it might be helpful to break it up um, into the, the two assessment questions, because as you see, the purpose really has two parts. You know, one is to assess the sufficient need and the interest to create a privacy law specialty. And then second is, uh, is the area, is the privacy law uh, sufficiently defined to create a useful specialization? And once we have answered these two questions in a sufficient manner for the state bar, then we go on to the second part of our purpose tasking which is to create the certification standards. So just to let the consulting group and the public know, um, we will be focused in, on our business on these two assessment questions uh, preliminarily. And when we have uh, reported uh, to the state bar uh, sufficient materials for them to, to approve us to move forward, we will then be moving to the second part, which is to discuss the certification standards. Let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, as we are beginning to think about um, these questions, the assessment questions that we talked about and the purpose for this consulting group, um, the State Bar thought that it might be helpful to start with, um, you know, who, who is CBLS? Who is the audience uh, to whom we'll be providing these materials? And, and how, um, how are the other specialty areas designed um, and how are they established uh, by the State Bar? So uh, CBLS, as you probably heard, is California Board of Legal Specialization and it's CBLS that is the audience um, that we will be reporting to. So once this consulting group has gathered the materials that sufficiently answer those two assessment questions that we just shared with you, um, then uh, we will be um, engaging uh, to present at the CBLS uh, meeting to get their approval to move forward again on, on deciding on the certification standards. 
taking a look at currently what areas um, have uh, been approved uh, to be a legal specialization. We want to send to uh, show you uh, this is the current list. The State Bar of California currently certifies legal specialists in the following areas. And uh, the information about these legal specialty areas are available on the CBLS website. Let me just give you a moment to take a look at the current legal specialist areas and see if you have any questions. And we'll go to the next slide. In addition to talking about the current specialty areas, uh, so we can have a context on where privacy law specialty uh, would be fitting in um, for the um, in comparison to the other specialty areas, we also want to highlight um, that the there are a number of uh, what uh, what the state bar considers to be accredited organizations. So there are accredited organizations listed here where they have been accredited by the state bar to provide the certifications. So uh, there is a, a process by which certain organizations outside of the state bar can be accredited to create cert uh, certification standards and to, to be involved in the certification process and uh, maintaining of the certifications. Okay, next slide, please. This is a general list of requirements to become a certified specialist. Uh, we know we uh, take a look at uh, the, the current 11 specialty areas that are existing by the CPLS. And uh, this is, uh, I guess, five uh, general requirements for um, how to become a certified specialist in these uh, specialty areas in the state of California currently. Um, one, it is a passage of a written examination in the legal specialty area. Second is to have practiced law continuously for at least five years, spending at least 25% of the time given to occupational endeavors practicing in that specialty area. Third is to complete continuing education in the specialty area greater than that required of the general licensees of the state bar. Fourth is demonstration of a broad-based and comprehensive experience in the specialty area based on completion of a variety of matters in the specialty area. And fifth, favorable evaluations by other attorneys and judges familiar with the attorney's work in the specialty area of law. So if you take a look at the application uh, requirements for the current existing uh, specialty areas, uh, these five are the general requirements um, that we have in the current spe uh, certified specialist areas for California. Next, please. So now that we have talked a, a little bit about uh, the current state, um, how CBLS has 11 specialty areas that have been approved and the general requirements for becoming a legal uh, specialist in California, we are going to now turn to answering the assessment questions as proposed um, earlier. So the need and interest for privacy law specialization. Next slide, please. We're going to be turning um, after uh, the, the after the guest speaker to get um, engagement from this group on uh, on what are the kinds of materials that we would want to present to CBLS. And so uh, we wanted to provide to you uh, what work has been done so far in terms of thinking about the need and interest for privacy law specialization. So the two applications uh, that uh, have been submitted recently, um, as you see here back in 2019 and in 2021, uh, we thought that uh, pointing to these applications would be a good starting point. So in 2019, uh, there was an application for a credit accreditation of specialty certification program uh, by the IAPP, International Association of Privacy Professionals. And then there was the proposed new specialty application by the CLA, California Lawyers Association in 2021. So uh, if, if the consulting group and the member are interested um, in taking a look at those applications, they are available publicly and we have provided the links to those applications. 
in those applications, both in the IEPP application and in the CLA uh, proposal, uh, you will see there was discussion by the two organizations, IEPP and CLA, about the need about the need and the interest for privacy law specialization because the application for accreditation and the proposal for a new specialty application, both of those applications ask uh, for uh, discussion about the need and interest for uh, that particular legal specialization. So we want to point to you uh, these two um, as, as background and as starting points. Um, and um, also to mention that this particular consulting group is in response to the CLA specialty application. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were there was a, a, a group of attorneys um, that were uh, participating from the CLA leadership, and several of us are have been appointed to be on this consulting consulting group. And that specialty application that was proposed by CLA was approved by the CBLS to move forward. So um, the IPP application is great uh, background material. The CLA application is what this consulting group is responding to. Any questions there on the historical context of how this group came about? Okay. If there is no question, then we will go to the next uh, section of this uh, of this uh, meeting. Uh, so the state bar um, had asked us to provide uh, some presentation on the privacy law today, and Ryan is going to be leading that discussion. And we will likely take a break um, after Ryan's presentation. Um, you know, at 11:30 ish, approximately, when our guest speaker comes, and then we will open it up for discussion to this group on um, the materials that have been uh, provided in the rest of the, the rest of the presentation. So uh, we will be discussing with the group um, the slides 29 and slide 30, likely after the break. So with that, Ryan, uh, please, um, if you can start with the presentation on the privacy law today. Yeah, thank you, Juwan. Um, so as Juwan mentioned, one of the things mm -hmm. the privacy law group was asked to do um, in the responding to the topic of privacy law as a distinct defined area of the law with its own specialty is to summarize what privacy law looks like today. So what is the current legal landscape? and also to present some of the history of privacy law. I'm gonna provide some information on what it looks like to be a privacy lawyer today and how we got here, which will include a walking through a brief timeline that shows the kind of escalating changes we're seeing in privacy law in California. So next slide, please. To give an overview of um, privacy law today, I would start off by describing that privacy law, one of the first things I'd say is that it's rapidly evolving. We've seen a lot of change, particularly in California in the last couple of years. Privacy law does not have a single comprehensive federal statutory scheme and states are generally permitted to pass their own privacy laws. Um, we see federal floors of, around privacy and then states are permitted to typically pass laws above those floors. This has led to a wide variety of different privacy laws that are typically focused on particular sectors or information types. Uh, one example that um, I'm familiar with is health information. HIPAA's privacy rule governs the use of protected health information at HIPAA covered entities from a federal perspective then California has its own health information privacy rules that can apply to entities not covered by HIPAA. And because even at the state level, California is not simple on its own, we have many, many different statutes and regulations that apply to health information and no single cohesive health privacy section of the law. So the analysis can get a little complicated. On top of that, you have other states passing their own privacy statutory schemes. Um, this slide shows there are five states with something similar to California's uh, Consumer Privacy Act, and there are 17 additional states with consumer privacy bills being proposed. You layer on top of that hundreds of international privacy laws and regulations, potential contractual requirements, court decisions, 
forthcoming proposed rules from state and federal entities, and finally, privacy best practices that we see in the industry. And it's just kind of a lot to track. It is a complex and evolving space. And while privacy initially started out rather slow moving, uh, legally speaking, with the advent of technology and data collection by government and private actors and the intersection with cybersecurity, it is now one of the fastest changing areas of the law with many regulations to take into consideration. So next slide, please. So how did we get here? Well, over the next four slides, I will give a timeline of privacy laws development, and I will share with you some of the highlights. The timeline certainly is not comprehensive, but I tried to capture most of the notable events. Um, I got a lot of this from the information. Oh, I got a lot of this information from the University of Michigan, and I encourage you to take a look at their web page. The link is at the bottom of the slide. But I also added in some California specific high points as well. Uh, so to begin, we have the creation of the U.S. Constitution in 1789, which does not specifically state that there's a right to privacy, but instead courts have found that there's a right to privacy in the Third Amendment's freedom from having to quarter soldiers as a freedom from government intrusion in our personal affairs. We have the Fourth Amendment guarantee uh, of freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures without probable cause. And it's cited by courts as evidence of a right to privacy in a person's body, homes, papers, and personal effects. And then we have the Fifth Amendment's protection against self-incrimination, which has been interpreted as justification of protection of private information. So over time, the Constitution has been interpreted to create privacy rights at the federal level. I note that these privacy protections are aimed at protecting citizens from intrusion by the government, but over time, uh, we've seen privacy law evolve to protect against intrusion by private companies as well. And that's really kind of where the focus is now. Um, so next on our timeline in 1890, about 100 years later, we see Justice Brandeis publish a law review article advocating for the right to privacy and articulating the right as a general right to be left alone. This is one of the first times we see privacy being raised as a major issue in legal writings. Then in 1914, we see the establishment of the Federal Trade Commission, which has been the chief federal agency on privacy policy and enforcement since privacy began to pick up momentum in the 1970s. In 1917, Judge William Lamar um, received, uh, gave privacy some support in official court rulings when the court ruled against the ability of the Bureau of Investigations to open and read mail for purposes of investigating acts of foreign sabotage in favor of protections of just sealed mail. Then a few decades later, in December of 1948, the United Nations recognized the right to privacy in the Declaration of Human Rights, stating that no one shall be subjected, subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to attacks upon your honor or reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference and attacks. Then we fast forward to the 1960s, and this is really when we start to see privacy interest growing and legal basis for privacy evolve. Uh, we have Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, where the Supreme Court recognized the right to marital privacy. Uh, then we have Katz v. United States in 1967, where Fourth Amendment protections I mentioned against unreasonable searches and seizures are applied to anywhere a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy. And then the same year, in 1967, California, as a leader in many things, including privacy laws providing privacy protections to disadvantaged groups, enacted the Lanterman Petra Short Act, protecting the rights of people with developmental disabilities by mandating dignity, privacy, and human care. Privacy law is often targeted at specific types of information or protecting a specific group. So as we go through this timeline, I'll mention some laws protecting online privacy of children, and we have laws protecting mental health records, psychiatric notes, substance abuse, and HIV information. Uh, frequently, privacy, a privacy law will be targeted at a certain type of information that may be considered more sensitive than other information. 
So next slide, please. So moving to the 1970s, in 1972, California used the initiative process to explicitly add privacy to Article I of our state constitution. Um, so the, the list of inalienable rights now say these are enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing and protecting property and pursuing and obtaining safety, happiness and privacy. And that really is kind mm -hmm. of a special thing. 1972 also had the Supreme Court privacy case, Einstadt v. Baird, which affirmed the right to privacy under the Constitution for all individuals, regardless of their marital status. In 1974, the federal government passed the Privacy Act of 1974 with a very creative name and also FERPA, protecting information collected by federal agencies and the privacy of student education records maintained by all schools receiving funds from the U.S. Department of Education. One year later, the federal government promulgated 42 CFR Part 2, which added some of the strictest privacy protections we as privacy practitioners work with, and that provides critical protections for vulnerable groups who are receiving substance abuse treatment. Um, 1977 saw California's passage of the Information Practices Act, which is a sort of state version of the Federal Privacy Act of 1974 and provide standards and requirements for the way the California government maintains and uses Californians' information. And 1977 also saw the release of the Privacy Commission's report on the impact of the Federal Privacy Act in 1974. Um, in 1981, we saw California in, enact the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, which created a somewhat comprehensive state-level privacy protection for medical information and it has some similar but different and overlapping protections to what we uh, see later show up in HIPAA in the 1990s. In 1986, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act was passed, along with the Do Not Call Registry, with both of these laws protecting against solicitation calls and allowing consumers to opt out of telemarketing calls. This is interesting because we're starting to see here in the timeline a turning from a focus on protecting citizens from government intrusion to more of a focus on regulating the privacy impacts of private companies' actions. So next slide, please. All right, so now we're in the 1990s and 2000s, and we saw even more developments in the world of privacy law, as you can see on the slide. The 1991 updates to the human subject research requirements created the common rule, which included research participant privacy standards at the federal level. In 1995, the European Union Data Protection Directive was passed in the EU, which was the precursor to the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation we see in 2018. And the European Union has always been kind of cutting edge on privacy issues. Uh, then we see HIPAA passed in 1996, which created some somewhat comprehensive federal health information and privacy and security standards. And this is probably one of the most well-known areas of privacy law. And while I don't list them on the timeline here, uh, HIPAA does have a few updates and, and expansions of its application to contractors of healthcare entities um, that come later on over the years. Um, in fact, we actually expect to see another update to HIPAA even this month. HIPAA is interesting because it also um, kind of normalized the sending of breach notification letters to people. And so that's kind of a common thing now. Um, so moving back to the timeline, in 1998, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, is enacted federally to provide protection to children, which are another vulnerable group when using the internet. The federal government then passed the Graham Leach Bliley Act in 1999, requiring disclosure of how financial institutions share customer data and give customers the opportunity to opt out of having their information shared and protect private information with certain security requirements. In 2002, we saw the passage of the e-government act, which included requirements for privacy impact assessments for federal agencies. Then in 2003, we had a few privacy developments here in California with the passage of a requirement for businesses to provide breach notifications to affected individuals who have their information improperly disclosed. 
and the California Online Privacy Protection Act of 2003 was the first state law requiring websites to have privacy policies. The red flags rule was passed in 2008 and that required financial institutions and creditors to develop written identity, identity theft programs. And then finally, uh, 2018 was a very busy year in California as it saw the implementation of the European Union's GDPR that gave expanded privacy rights in the European Union and the passage of the California Consumer Privacy Act that gave consumers more control over personal information that businesses in California collect about them, including rights to delete personal information collected from them to know what personal information a business has collected and how it is used and shared, the right to opt out of the sale and sharing of personal information and the right to non-discrimination for exercising those rights. So next slide, please. And here we see uh, changes in privacy law in California over the last three years, beginning with the CCPA going into effect and the establishment of the California Privacy Protection Agency. In August of 2020, the Department of Justice promulgated implementing regulations of the CCPA. And then that November, the California Privacy Rights Act amended the CCPA that was passed. The CPR, the CPRA was passed by proposition and added rights to correct inaccurate personal information maintained by businesses in California and rights to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information. Then in March of 2021, the CCPA regulations were amended. In September of 2021, California passed the Gen Genetic Information Privacy Act, which covers direct to consumer genetic testing. And then very recently, this year in January, the CPRA went into effect in California. And just last month, the CPPA, the California Privacy Protection Agency, submitted a regulatory rulemaking file to the Office of Administrative Law. We should be hearing about that package any day now. It could even be today. I think we're real close to the deadline on that one. The CPPA also requested comments on another rulemaking file addressing cybersecurity audits and risk assessments. Enforcement actions regarding the CPRA can begin this coming July, so businesses in California are now scrambling hard to achieve compliance. And that sums up my timeline of major milestones in privacy law in California. And it really is just the highlights. There are many other statutes beyond this, um, but I think we'd be here all day if I ran through all of them. Um, so there are lots of uh, considerations that we as privacy lawyers need to take in on a daily basis. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide just highlights the federal versus state considerations we have to consider when reviewing the law for specific privacy issues. There's constitutional privacy, statutes, regulations, any case law that explains things, and then agency guidance. Frequently, there will be more than one state privacy law on point. And if you're working with entities that cross state lines, there may be other states' privacy laws, or increasingly, there are international considerations because of the connection, connected nature of our modern world. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide just shows some examples of different large statutory schemes that address different industry sectors and highlights how different states might have their own industry specific statutes to take into consideration. And those different statutes always have different standards that we're applying. Frequently, there'll be crossover issues as well. So for example, in the health, healthcare space where I operate, um, my analysis frequently includes HIPAA and California's confidentiality and medical information law, but I also deal with issues regarding FERPA, the TCPA, IPA Information Practices Act, COPPA, the CCPA, uh, part two at the federal level, and then uh, just a wonderful mix of health and safety code statutes that don't really have a great name, but they're there and you need to look them up and take them into account with your analysis. So next slide, please. Uh, this slide highlights the growth we've seen in international privacy laws. And while EU's uh, general data protection regulation tends to be the one that grabs the headlines, 
71% or 137 out of 194 countries have a data protection um, and privacy legislation enacted and 9% more have draft legislation under consideration. So that's at the, you know, that's at national levels. That's not even considering state levels. Um, for example, China passed a data protection law and a data security law in 2021 with a series of implementation regulations and administrative rules addressing requirements for use, disclosure, and protection of personal information, um, with many of the specifics of the regulations coming out later in 2022. Uh, that's not even talked about that much, but it's a huge market and it has huge implications for us with all of the uh, companies that do business with China, which is quite a lot. In a global economy with privacy considerations like this, it really is um, quite a challenge for companies with a global presence in markets around the world to be able to keep up. And from a compliance perspective, having legal counsel that stays informed of those requirements and provides accurate guidance really is critical. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned in an earlier slide that there are federal and state agencies that provide administrative opinions, regulations, and enforcement activity. And here we see some of the regulators privacy lawyers need to be aware of um, at both the federal and state levels. This is not an exhaustive list, but it does have some of the highlights that we uh, are aware of here in California and we take into account. Next slide, please. Here you really see kind of the evolution of the uh, CPPA, the CPRA, and the Privacy Protection Agency. Um, they really make those acronyms a mouthful. Uh, I thought about sharing a list of all of the privacy laws in California um, to kick this off. And the best list that I could come up with is on the Attorney General's website. But when I started to convert that into something to share, the list was so long that I decided to just share a link because it would be a ton of slides. Um, also, the list does not include all of the implementing regulations of the statutes that are listed there. So it's it's a long list. Take a look at it. And um, with if you added in the regulations, it's quite a bit longer. So next slide, please. Um, so where does all of this leave us on the state of privacy law in California today? And what is our overall trend? Well, privacy laws were initially focused on preventing government intrusion into personal matters. But over the years, uh, this has grown to create rights for individuals and obligations for both government and private entities. As the statutes and regulations have grown, they've covered more individuals and more sectors of our economy, and we've become more interconnected um, and with our digital economy, we see more crossover of those different sectors and their respective privacy laws and privacy statutory schemes. The legal analysis has become complex and privacy lawyers have to be continuous learners and stay up to date on a truly rapidly evolving area of the law. We have to be willing to learn new areas in real time as rules are, are implemented and released. As I mentioned, we could get a couple this week. One thing I want to do highlight is the technical aspect of privacy law. I believe we have a couple uh, information cybersecurity uh, experts on our PLG, and I think that's that's really critical. Um, privacy is uniquely influenced by technological advancements in cybersecurity and big data analysis. We're seeing rapid changes in artificial intelligence and computing power that change security postures and the way we store our private information and what we once considered state-of-the-art data de-identification standards um, may be just identifiable data tomorrow. Encryption and data security standards are constantly evolving with increasing computing power and effective privacy lawyers need to maintain a working knowledge of technical issues uh, to effectively recognize some of our privacy issues when we work on behalf of our clients. We need to be able to partner with and effectively support our IT and cybersecurity counterparts. And that means being able to speak their language. So we have to strive to maintain that necessary level of technical and information security expertise to be good, effective partners. 
Next slide, please. So this is my last sl slide. And despite the complexity and challenge of the various privacy laws and standards that we work with, um, I wanna highlight what privacy law today does and what an effective privacy lawyer can help their clients with. Privacy laws at their core create trust. Individuals are able to know their rights and what will happen to their information and users of information know their responsibilities. Common standards also enable disclosures of information and recipients to negotiate from places of common understanding and expectations so we know information is properly protected and responsibly being used. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, so um, for the next uh, five minutes uh, before we have our North Carolina guest speaker um, uh, join our meeting, uh, I would like to continue with our next portion of the of the discussion and the business for this meeting. So if you can get the slide back up, Janelle, please. So we are going to uh, to introduce uh, the discussion that we will be having uh, for the the three. B, um, and uh, we will have the guest speaker speak, and we will break, and we'll come back, and hopefully we'll be able to hear from um, the individual members of the consulting group. So um, as uh, Ryan's um, you know, very um, eloquently presented in terms of the timeline, um, the evolution of the privacy laws, um, the federal, the state, um, and the international privacy laws, we really kind of talked about how uh, it has developed over time and how um, the, the new laws are really kind of coming uh, fast and furious. You know, we're, we're, I think hopefully we have provided uh, some information to give you the historical context, but also the speed with which the new uh, emerging laws are being established and also um, how the technology changes are uh, really kind of making it a, a challenge for the, the lawyers uh, to, to stay up to date and to remain um, an expert in how these laws are interpreted and applied to businesses. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, um, the questions, uh, here is the list of the questions that the State Bar is asking for us to answer. Um, and uh, I would like to highlight here that it's not just uh, impact to the businesses that we are concerned about. We are concerned about the impact to the public. And we're also going to be talking about how does the specialization benefit the public and, and the businesses um, and, and the clients that we have that are businesses and also individuals. So the first question that the State Bar proposed uh, for us to answer, and we're going to be sharing in the next slide, um, the list of materials that we hope will be responsive to these questions. So the first question was, um, can we take a look at first, what are the California privacy law cases? And um, the first question is this question, right? How do we uh, how do we define what is a California privacy law and what is not? And once we have that scope, uh, can we take a look at um, whether they are represented by attorneys or are they pro se cases? So that's a question of um, really kind of thinking about again the need assessment. Going back to our assessment questions. Um, does, does the fact that a number of cases are being filed and they're being represented by attorneys, does that say something? Or are cases being filed pro se? And uh, does the fact that uh, there are um, X number of cases being, pro, uh, being filed pro se versus other, um, how does that um, answer the state bar's question on the need for privacy lawyers? That's the first question. Second question is, how do the privacy laws impact the California public? And as you see there, we have separate questions to answer. It's not just the impact to the businesses, but also the California public. So please keep in mind um, that as we are talking about the materials that we're putting together for the, the state bar to consider, uh, we want to talk about how the laws impact the public and also how they impact businesses. The, the last three questions are really focused on, um, so what? So if we were to create a privacy law specialization, how, how would that benefit the public? How would that benefit the licensees of the bar? And then how does it advance the state bar's mission? So again, it's, a, it's three different ways to think about 
how the law uh, privacy law specialization would benefit the different stakeholders. And so um, we're going to go next to the, the next slide, please. Um, as we are thinking about um, these findings, uh, here is a list of findings that we would like the consulting group to help uh, put together. And uh, while we are thinking about what materials to pull for each of these topics, uh, we please keep in mind the questions that we are uh, we have been asked by the state bar to answer. Uh, we have broken here um, again just to help organize. On the left hand side is the need and interest question. And on the right hand side is the privacy law as a defined area of law. Um, and of course, um, you know, based on the cons consulting group's uh, comments, uh, we, can, we can move <laughs> this from one category to another. Uh, but this was our um, kind of uh, first uh, presentation in trying to think about uh, which of these findings fall into the need and interest question, which of them fall into defining privacy law as a defined area of law. Um, these are not written in stone. Um, of course, some of these answers are going to be responsive to you know, one or both of the assessment questions. On the left-hand side, we have other states with privacy law specialization. We hope that that will answer uh, part of the need and interest question, that it's not just California that has 11 specialty areas, uh, but the other states that have currently already a privacy law specialization. The number of bar associations that have a privacy specialty, uh, we, we have bar associations like the California Bar Association, the CLA, the California Lawyers Association, that have established uh, privacy law as a separate section, but there are five other states. Um, and I would say the question is not just limited to state level bar association, but we know that there are local, uh, there is uh, Orange County Bar Association, there is the Bar Association of San Francisco, there are uh, ethnic and minority groups um, um, associations like the Asian American Bar Association that have um, established a separate section um, that's focused on privacy. So the question about bar association is broad. The next is the California privacy cases. That's responsive to the question that the state bar was asking. How do, they, how do we define, what does it mean to have a California privacy case? And how would we go about uh, putting, uh, presenting to the bar um, that the California privacy cases show the need and interest for privacy lawyers? Enforcement actions, uh, Ryan uh, gave a very good presentation about the regulatory agencies um, that are not only involved in the rulemaking, but also bringing enforcement actions. So part of the materials that uh, the state bar has asked to put together is the enforcement actions with privacy focus. Again, the question to the consulting group will be which agencies and which enforcement actions, you know, how do we uh, put prepare uh, the scope of the enforcement actions so that it is something that we can present um, in, a, in a limited time uh, for the presentation to the bar. Um, and then the public interest and advocacy groups with privacy focus. Again, the question is, um, you know, how many should we highlight? Um, what is, how do we go about defining? What does it mean to have a privacy focus and which ones should we highlight? Uh, to present to the bar. Um, very quickly, because I think Brian is probably waiting uh, to come on um, and we have to, uh, we would like to have our guest speaker speak. On the right hand side, uh, we had a presentation from Ryan uh, on the privacy law today. Uh, we would like to put that in a more formal way uh, to present uh, what is privacy law today to the bar. The list of legislatures that have privacy focus, California does. We have the Assembly and the Senate with uh, specific um, committees focused on privacy. Uh, but what about other states? Uh, what other states have specific committees focused on, on privacy? And then last, law schools. What law schools um, have privacy law curriculum? So those are the, the findings um, that we hope each member of the consulting group will volunteer to take lead in presenting and preparing materials for the bar to consider. So uh, please think about that during your break. Um, and uh, before we break, we would like to give uh, time uh, to our special guest from North Carolina, Brian. Hello, everyone. Can you, can you? Okay. Can All you right. hear me? Yes. All right. 
I have no idea how this is uh, looking right now. I can't see. Uh, hopefully it's framed fine. You can play the game of what books and Funko Pop characters are on my bookshelf behind me um, while, uh, while I do this. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm Brian Oten. I'm with the North Carolina State Bar Board of Legal Specialization. I'm the director for the specialization program here in North Carolina. Um, and I was asked to join you all to just talk about our privacy and information security law specialty uh, which has been in existence now for roughly five years. We certified our first uh, specialist in this area in 2018. So um, that said, what I want to do first is uh, just make sure that uh, you all can see my screen. I'm going to, I've got a very short presentation. I understand I'm just here for about uh, 30 minutes to give you an overview of our program, as well as uh, give you all a chance to just ask whatever questions and see if I can give you some answers the, from our experience and putting this specialty into existence um, and maybe uh, offer any sort of uh, insight of, you know, what we might do differently if we were doing it over again right now. Um, so uh, let me first ask, can you all see, are you seeing the screen, the presentation? Can I get a quick, all right. See, I see some, some thumbs up. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so let me just give you a quick overview of how North Carolina operates so you can understand the context in which this particular specialty came about, um, because we do things a little differently in North Carolina. I understand that California is in a big transition right now from the unified bar to kind of the separate uh, state bar, uh, as well as bar association. Um, so this, what where we are at, it sounds like you guys are kind of moving into that direction, so it might start sounding a little more familiar, but let me just make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, so first, uh, just as far as background, you know, like I said, the North Carolina State Bar is an agency, a state agency here in North Carolina that's tasked with regulating the legal profession. We are separate from the Bar Association. We are mandatory, but we don't do anything but regulate the profession. That's discipline, issuing ethics opinions, or, uh, you know, amending the rules of professional conduct, things of that nature. Um, incorporated in our regulatory function is the legal specialization program. Uh, the legal specialization program was created in the early 1980s, about 1983. I think we certified our first folks in 1987. Uh, but we were created uh, to really, even before we had mandatory CLE, this was supposed to be the incentive to get folks to take CLE and raise the competency of the bar. But the, the purpose, of course, is to identify for the public lawyers that have particular proficiency in different practice areas. At the moment, we have 14 different specialties. Um, our first ones were bankruptcy, real property, and then estate planning and probate. Um, you can see here, these are all the specialties that we have. And our newest ones, the, the, the most recent one was child welfare law. That came into existence uh, early part, I should say late 2021. And, uh, but before that, it was privacy and information security law. That was the most recent one. Uh, privacy and information security law uh, was one of those that, that came about. And from what I understand, we were the first state to certify in this particular area. Um, and, uh, and I think you can probably see as, as much as, you know, it feels like, well, it's North Carolina. Why is North Carolina interested in this? we have the research triangle. There's a lot of tech uh, in our area. And I think there's been, a, there's been a boom really across the country and across the world for privacy and information security issues. But um, it, it became, it got kind of presented. I'm gonna go through the background of how this specialty came to our attention uh, and, uh, and what we, the steps that we took there. Um, now, just as an aside, one of the things that we have in North Carolina, we're a little different than California and that you can't use the term specialized or specialist at all in North Carolina unless you're certified as a specialist. Um, I know in California, you all, you all are similar to the model rules where you can't say you're a certified specialist unless that's actually true, but you can say you specialize in a particular practice area. That word specialized is totally off limits in North Carolina. Um, I understand it's kind of like a 50-50 split across the country as far as what version of the rule we have, but we are slightly different here. Um, so. How we propose a specialty in North Carolina, uh, I understand is also a little different than what you all do. And I, this background is really just kind of give you the information for how this all came about. It was kind of more of a grassroots campaign. Generally speaking, a lawyer or an interested group is the one that petitions the Board of Legal Specialization to create a new specialty. And they have some different requirements. They, you know, they have a petition and a form really that they have to provide that, that requires them to you know, kind of outline 
uh, what CLE opportunities uh, exist? Is there any overlap between the proposed specialty and any current specialties? Um, good example being our most recent one, child welfare. There was a big question of, is there too much overlap between child welfare law and family law? Uh, which of course there, there wasn't. There's some, there's some back and forth in some ways that they work together, but they're very distinct areas of law. Um, so there's those different things, but then the, the big things, just as far as numbers, every proposed specialty needs at least 100 lawyers that say they think this specialty is, is legitimate, relevant, and something that's, that would be helpful to the profession and to the public. 20 lawyers that are willing to uh, apply for certification, and 10 lawyers that are willing to serve on the specialty committee that creates the standards, drafts the exams, all that kind of stuff. So you have to get through that first hurdle before you can get to the board of legal specialization. And we did have that. We had one particular lawyer uh, that was uh, uh, over, I think at the time he was in Raleigh, now he's over in Greensboro. Uh, but he, uh, he was the one that kind of brought this to the board of legal specialization with all this different support and basically said, you know, we, we think this is a new area um, and nobody's certifying in this, at least on the state level, uh, at this moment, but we think that it'd be appropriate for North Carolina to be the first. So um, we went ahead and, um, it, and of course, as far as like the, the standards for the specialty, you have to draft those things, right? And, and the first thing you have to get it through the board, then you have to go back to the state bar council, which is kind of like the, our Congress of lawyers, lawyers from across the state sit on this state bar council and they have to publish the rules, get feedback and then approve them. And then they send them to our Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court is the one that has the final say on everything. So it has to go through a number of steps, but it really starts with the lawyers in this state that feel a particular area is worthy of some type of specialty certification. Um, so what happened with our privacy and information law, uh, or privacy and information security law specialty? In around mid-2016, this lawyer, Matthew Cordell, uh, he, he inquired with us about creating this new specialty. And, and I've talked to him about, you know, what was the, the origin of this idea? And he just kind of said that there was, <laughs> he re-recognized the, the nuance of this particular practice area, um, that, that he saw there are a lot of other practice areas that uh, were, that did have certifications, trademark law, family law, real property, things of that nature. And realizing that, that privacy and information security was really on the verge of an explosion. It was already kind of starting to explode, but that there, were, there was a, a stronger need for services, an increasing need for services, and really just therefore he felt like this is something where people are going to be looking for qualified individuals. Um, I'll get into a little bit more of his thought process in the next slide, but generally speaking, our timeline took about one year, maybe a, a year and a half to actually propose it and get it through the Supreme Court. You see here the, the board basically created a subcommittee after it was proposed or after this, this lawyer uh, inquired about how do, I, how do I actually present this to the board. The board created a subcommittee to start drafting those standards. They approved the standards in January of 2017, uh, sent them to the State Bar Council. They published them and approved them by April 2017 sent them over to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agreed with them uh, by September 2017. So like I said, from, from the first time that he contacted the State Bar and said, what do you all think of this new specialty to when the Supreme Court said, yes, we think this is a good idea. We approve uh, of the new standards that you've proposed. It took roughly 18 months, a little under 18 months. We certified our first folks in this particular area in November of 2018. We currently have 17 specialists. Uh, that are certified in privacy and information security law. So the thing that 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 Matthew Cordell was telling me about, you know, when we when he started this this journey, um, he was just kind of recognizing in 2016 he was you know one of just a small handful of folks in North Carolina that had a a privacy and cybersecurity practice, um, but saw that it was it was on a lot of people's minds and a lot of different topics and CLE presentations, things of that nature, um, and saw just kind of the potential for this, this explosion and the need for the public to be able to have folks that really, uh, that really do want uh, somebody who's proficient in this area. And, and at the time, there was only the IAPP. I'm sure you all are familiar with IAPP, uh, but IAPP, they offered that um, CIPP US certification, which was not exclusive to lawyers, both lawyers and non-lawyers could take it. Um, and, and he was explaining that that was 
partial or that was a partial concern that you know at the time we think a lot of lawyers that had the IAPP certification as existed in 2016 felt like you know that that it wasn't as rigorous to take the test you know and, and they wanted something a bit more meaningful um, it was also limited to just privacy issues and of course there's privacy and then there's also the cybersecurity aspect of that and the consequences thereof which are very state specific um, and so as he was describing, he said, you know, we, we just saw the, the nuance that existed in this area and, and, and the increasing importance of this area and the, and the, the legal services that are being provided um, that really he, he wanted to start out this, this effort to create something a bit more meaningful than what was currently available. Um, so that's where, that's where the, the origin came from. He talked to some other privacy lawyers in North Carolina, they all agreed and they, they started making this push. Um, as they started developing the standards, really, they were, they were talking about, well, what exactly are we trying to do here? What should this thing, if we want it to be more meaningful than the IAPP certification that's available, which is really the only one that was available at the time, what do we, what do we want it to reflect? Um, and, and he was talking about how you know, they were looking at, yes, federal regulations clearly are a big thing, but we want state-specific stuff too. Um, and particularly in North Carolina, you know, there's uh, I guess he was describing, I'm not a subject matter expert in this, just to be clear, but he was describing to me how um, the, the, the view of the United States law when, with regards to privacy issues, you know, it was really kind of separated privacy and security. And that seems to be evolving, he was telling me, that it's, it's starting to merge, blend together, similar to, to what you see in the EU. And, I, you know, he pointed out California's uh, uh, Consumer Privacy Act is a good example of kind of where he thinks the laws in each state are going, but still there is such a state specific component that really needed to be recognized and that IAPP's certification did not. Um, so they started developing these different standards. Of course, the CLE and substantial involvement were kind of the typical requirements, but peer review, you know, recognizing that this is something that, yes, it's state specific, but it also has a national pull. They didn't want to follow the trend that our other specialties did, you know, where you have peer review and everybody has to be a North Carolina licensed lawyer um, if you want to have a peer review for family law or criminal law. In that situation, they felt like, no, we want, we'll just kind of require that half of your peer review be North Carolina licensed, you know, so we still have representation in North Carolina, but otherwise get somebody from another jurisdiction because clearly there's, there's cross-border issues when it comes to information in general and the collaboration that you have in this practice area. Um, and then so when it came down to the exam, they looked at, well, what do we want to do here? We want it to encompass both the federal and the state specific. And we recognize that, you know, as much as the IAPP one, we, we felt like it, or they felt like it was not as rigorous, but it was still a valuable thing. So they thought, well, what if we offered kind of a blended approach? You have to take the IAPP test, uh, the CIPP US uh, certification test, as well as a new North Carolina crafted exam that really did have both federal and state questions on there, but they encompass not just the privacy stuff, but also the security aspect of this practice, the consequences, the requirements, all those different things. Um, so they, they wanted to kind of blend this together. They also kind of thought that, well, maybe this will offer an incentive. Those that are certified by IAPP, uh, if we say that if you've passed the IAPP test, you kind of are halfway there through the exam to be North Carolina certified. Uh, so that was, that was an idea, um, a hope that, that perhaps that would be a bit of a incentive for folks to apply to North Carolina certification uh, if, uh, if they've already got their IAPP certification. So that's why they kind of did this hybrid sort of approach uh, for the exam. More on that um, shortly, because <laughs> when, when I was talking to him about, well, what are you doing now? And what would you, would you do it the same way all over again? And this is where he was talking about that, you know, the IAPP now has this privacy law specialist. I guess that came out in the midst of our efforts to create our new specialty. You know, they, they felt like the CIPP US uh, certification was just not as, as impactful as they thought it should be from a lawyer perspective. And it seems like IAPP had heard that feedback from a number of sources as well. And they created the privacy law uh, specialist certification, which is now ADA approved. Um, 
it is more rigorous, but it is still focused on privacy. Um, and, and that was something where they still felt like, you know, that was a very helpful thing um, that they did, but they wanted the security aspect because it's, you know, it, it's the more complete picture. Um, and so he was, what his, I asked him if he had any recommendations for you all, any other jurisdiction that is looking to start a privacy specialty. Uh, and his recommendation was to, you know, recognize that, yes, IAPP is kind of the, that's the most known name and organization, but state certification can still offer incredible value. And he thought that California's certification uh, efforts, he thought that was the kind of like a no brainer uh, because of all that exists, all that's going on in California, the, the laws that you all have and, and just the population that you serve, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, but that the state specialty certification should distinguish itself from IAPP. He, he was saying that, that in his experience and talking with his peers, he feels like the way that, that we went about kind of fusing our specialty or tying our specialty to the IAPP in that exam component, uh, that that was supposed to create an incentive, but it really may have caused a lot of confusion. That there are some folks that are wondering, uh, that he's talked to that feel like, well, you know, I, I can take the IAPP thing and it's, I know it's tied to North Carolina, but why do I even need to bother with the North Carolina side? Because I've already got my IAPP. You think it's valuable enough, you know, and is it really testing the same thing? Is it testing something different? What is the distinction between the two? And is it worth my time and effort? And so he was saying that if he had to go back and do it again, he might not include the IAPP aspect as part of their exam standards, but to instead just keep it entirely focused as a, a North Carolina certification that complements what IAPP offers. You know, so somebody can go and you can get your IAPP certification, but you're going to get your California certification too, your North Carolina certification, whatever it may be. Because the North Carolina one, the state specific one, needs to be something if you're providing this, this resource for the public that shows lawyers that are proficient in a particular area, that's gonna be incredibly valuable to folks, but they need to know the proficiency is in the jurisdiction where they exist. And, and a lot of these laws, yes, they are, there's a lot of federal stuff out there, but there's so much state specific stuff out there that really requires a proficient lawyer in that jurisdiction. And he felt like it would have been the better thing to really kind of separate and have exclusively focused on the state requirements. So um, that was, and of course, to encompass both privacy and security. Privacy laws are certainly important, but that the security aspect of this practice area is so critical uh, when advising folks about, you know, what happens kind of that second step if something bad happens, what, whatever it may be. So um, that was his, his recommendation. Um, and I have to say being uh, it kind of, I guess, our, our our director of the program. I agree with his recommendations. I see, you know, we've we've got we've had a couple of folks that are interested in our certification, but I know I've seen their comments of, oh, well, I have to go take the IAPP one. I'm not interested in taking that one. You know, they have their reaction to the current CIPP US uh, certification, and it's evolved since then. And some folks have just decided I, I'm not interested in North Carolina because I have to take that other test and I'm really not interested in that test. Um, so I'm just not gonna pursue it at all. And I, I feel like that may be something that we need to adjust in the future to kind of, uh, I guess, uh, separate ourselves from that and just have a, a purely North Carolina drafted administered exam that may be complementary to what's going on with IPP, but it really stands on its own feet. Um, and, and so we're, we're considering that um, as, as an adjustment for the future of our program. But um, with that said, I just want to give that, that overview uh, and open this up for questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so uh, we just have a, a full picture of everybody here. I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. I have one question. Uh, first off, uh, Brian, thank you so much for the presentation and for your experience on how you developed um, this specialization. It was very helpful for me. And this is more based on my involvement and in work with the community of bar examiners to have the license exam for attorneys. Um, my main concern 
and it's not with you at all. It's more about the requirements of CIPP or IPP as you put it, and most specifically with any type of examinations and whatnot. It's interesting because based on my experience, past experience, all my mentors and advocates for me have told me do not pursue a CIPP mm. unless if your employer can pay for that. And so, and not only that, there's of course the renewal and the, um, oh shoot, the CPE, something, uh, continuing privacy education requirements. And I was told specifically, don't just randomly get it because you have to maintain it and up to date because I was previously licensed through CompTIA. I had a lifetime certificate for CompTIA for A plus Network Plus and Security Plus. And then they retroactively just nullified that when I was in law school. So, you know, I did it, but it means nothing now. Um, and that's in the community of our examiners. Our main concern is the financial burdens and the renewal burdens of individuals and the unnecessary obligation to tack more and more things onto applicants that's not reasonable. Of course, they have the Blue Ribbon Commission happening now to streamline and refine that power exam. I do not have knowledge, current knowledge on what's happening for that, but that's something in which um, while exploring this, it's interesting how you say you probably will not need the IO, you, if I have been misheard you, not necessarily need IPP or the CIPP. Um, I love that. And I love to show, I mean, I am all up for reasonable renewals and registration and an extra requirement of hours. I'm just worried about the, I know from my mentors, the CPE, it charges money for some of the conferences and oh, some of the hours and you can't find them. I know there's that problem. Uh, I haven't done it myself, so I don't know how easily obtainable is it to keep up with the hours of the CPE requirements. Um, yeah, it's just me expressing my concerns of, I'm, you won't hear when I express I'm one of the top cybersecurity professionals and software engineers, as well as an attorney. My, I've been told by my mentors, don't do CIPP, have your employer pay for that. It's costly. And it, unless if your employment needs it, there's no reason to pursue it. And my employment currently was have been public interest works and other works in which I found during my interviews in the past, it was a huge detriment just to know technology, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, really, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I think that is a, one of the reasons why we are looking at kind of separating ourselves from IAPP. At the time when this came about, IAPP was it, you know, it was the thing. And so I think that's that was part of their idea of, well, we can attach ourselves to this group and, you know, kind of try to, kind of the, the thought of, what is it, the, the rising tide uh, raises all ships uh, sort of thing. Um, and I think we're seeing now that one, it's like you said, it may not be necessary. Maybe it's something that's just nice to have if you want it, but it's costly. And we need to reduce those barriers to entry. Um, the, the thing, you know, of course, it brings up the question then of, well, just specialization in general, you know, the benefit to it. Um, and I think that's where we have seen in North Carolina, the combination of you know, there's, I, I feel like there's the cynical view, and this is just, this is applicable to any specialty certification. The cynical view of, well, it's just something to use to advertise and separate yourself. Um, and that, don't get me wrong, there's people that will do that too. But the thing that we've also seen in North Carolina, for one, we, after every one of our exam rounds, we survey our applicants and ask, why did you do this? And how did you learn about it? Um, everybody says that they were, not everybody, but I'd say the vast majority answer, one, they were told about certification, encouraged to apply for certification because a peer recommended it, you know, maybe even a, a competitor. And they just said, you know your stuff. I think you'd really, I think you should do this. But the other thing that they see it as that they, when they have an option of, you know, why do you want to pursue this? One of the options is 
for advertising, marketing purposes. And that is increasingly lower on the priority. The top answers are the increased sense of professionalism and that frankly, just studying for the exam required them to get better. And, and that is something I'm, I'm, I'm personally just really proud to hear. We've also seen an increase in public interest lawyers apply for specialty certification who cannot advertise, they can't charge higher fees. They're doing it as one of, uh, one of our public defenders, the public defender of Wake County, which is where Raleigh is, it's the biggest county in the state. Um, he's a specialist and he said that his, his desire in pursuing certification and achieving certification was so that he could convince people to let him represent them for free. Uh, and, and it's that sort of sense of the confidence in the legal services. So I hear what you're saying. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, you don't want to unnecessarily create something that just tacks on and it becomes this thing that, well, now everybody has to do it because they're trying to just keep up with the whole, the, the pack. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say I, I get a different sense in North Carolina. I think there are some areas where maybe that, that has that sentiment. But there's, there have been just as many, if not more, sentiments of, I'm doing this for me because I feel like I actually have achieved it. It's my journey. Um, and, and I want to show folks what I can do uh, and let them feel confident in my services. Um, and so that's been, that's it, but it's finding that balance, like you said. You know, it's, and that's why I think we need to, frankly, I do think that, that we probably need to separate ourselves so it's not a requirement to go with this national organization um and and to your point where you said you know something maybe gets taken away and then there's the question of well what was the point of all that i feel like that's the value of the state certification and not relying on the national national organizations can provide a, a great service um you know to kind of unify folks from across different jurisdictions but state organizations states aren't going away and the state regulatory bodies if they are serving the public and the purpose of of specialization is to provide this resource to the public that says you member who is looking out there, you're Googling things and you see all sorts of awards and uh, you know, distinctive sort of self-promoting organizations that are giving these different certificates. Um, I mean, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. We've seen them in North Carolina, all of the place where it's, it's, it's this self-laudatory group that, that's really a pay for play thing. Um, we've said that they're unethical to participate in. But when you offer an objective proficiency that's through this nonprofit that we call the our state agency, um, it's I think it offers a level of ob objectivity that benefits the public. And so it's it's finding that balance. I hear exactly what you're talking about, and I think those are the different steps that you can improve on. i I think there's there's a value to the state certification. Um, it, but uh, but it has to be reasonable to allow everybody to access it. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you, Michael, for the question. I'm just doing a time check. We're at noon now, and I see two questions uh, from Arson and Ryan. Um, if you do have a question for Brian, please uh, raise your hand and we will recognize you. Um, and if this is not a question, but it's a comment, uh, perhaps we can let our guest speaker go and then we can continue to discuss. Um, so um, I did not see which, uh, you know, wh whether it was Arson or Ryan that raised uh, the hand first. Uh, do you know? Arson is, uh, is lowering his hand, so maybe uh, it was more of a discussion. Ryan, do you yeah. have a question for our speaker? Uh, Arson was first, so I want to give him an opportunity. It sounds like Arson um, is okay. It's not a question for yeah, okay. speaker. Okay. Uh, well, I will ask my question then. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for, for coming. The, the, this was like really eye-opening and, and fantastic from my perspective. Um, my question is for the cyber security kind of standards, that's such a quick moving field. You've talked a little bit about the IAPP stuff uh, and partnering with them, and that, that gives you a lot of the, the privacy components of an exam. Uh, is the cyber components, are, are those written in-house? Did you partner with a, a cybersecurity company to kind of develop some of those standards, or do you just have folks that do that and are they revising it like continuously on a to, to stay up up to speed yeah they so and and i and i realize this janelle i don't think i ever sent you our standards um and i need to send that to you so i apologize i'm going to send it to you and you can distribute it to this group um yeah this you're that's 
that's the the damnedest thing of doing any of these things. Whether you're talking about an ethics opinion, because I'm the chief ethics counselor here too. So that's you know uh, something else we do. We read these ethics opinions, and as soon as they go to print, they're outdated if they're discussing technology. Um, and so, for one, as far as the creation of the standards, that we relied upon our community of lawyers that had the privacy and security practices in existence. Um, and they brought in outside folks too. You know, we, they, they went to the, the bar association, the privacy uh, uh, section over there to say, you know, who wants to, even if you're not interested in being a certified specialist here, we want to get your input. And they, they had a number of meetings in terms of drafting the standards as well as drafting the exam, what should be there. We had a round of a beta exam, got some feedback from folks. Um, you know, so we, we kind of brought in the North Carolina uh, experts, I guess, uh, as, as, as they may be. Um, but then as far as drafting the standards, you know, there's, I feel like there's that, there's, to me, there's a fine line between specificity and, and keeping it broad enough that allows the evolution of the practice area. And that is something that's just going to be so incredibly specific. Like if, if you guys have, you know, just, um, the, you know, the California Consumer Privacy Act or whatever, like that's going to be on the exam whatever format it's in at the moment, whether it's 2023 or 2033, and maybe it's gonna be something different. You know, we had this actually with immigration recently where we saw the standards that were drafted in the late nineties when I, I came into this role in the mid to, or uh, 2010s and, um, <laughs> and started looking at some of the standards and saw there's, there are terms in the immigration standards that just don't exist anymore. Um, so we need to update these things. So that is, that's the, I would say the, the, the part that is difficult because you have to you have to amend them you have to go through the process to amend the administrative rule that creates the standards go through the supreme court again but of course it does add that much more legitimacy because it's gone through those steps again so i don't know of any sort of easy fix to that it's really just having the folks that are on the committee at the outset drafting it in a way that kind of allows enough of that evolution and but but still highlighting what aspects like our standards, they refer to a number of different state and federal acts, regulations, um, you know, even broadly referring to European uh, or European Union data protection requirements. You know, it's, it's stuff like that, that it, it's, it's not going to drill down and say this particular section of this particular act but it's going to give enough, almost like a notice pleading uh, sort of thing of a specialist is gonna be proficient in these areas. The exam is gonna cover these topics and it's gonna be something that we will have to evolve. This area in particular is, is one that will need more attention. And I think it has actually been, a, it's been uh, amended since it came or since it was first approved in 2017. I think we had an amendment go through in 2021 as well because it needed to be updated. And that's just, it's extra work, but it's gonna be worth it. All right, thank you very much, Brian. And I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much for spending the time and presenting to us. Absolutely, I'm glad to join you all. Please let me know if I can be of assistance in the future. Thanks very much, Brian. Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, um, I know that Arson had a comment. So um, Arson, the floor is yours. Yeah, I want to just make a couple of points in response to the feedback provided about what happened in the other state with developing the privacy specialization. For starters, the CIPP US exam does cover cyber. Um, there is incident response section. It's a very comprehensive exam that covers a number of topics, including privacy, uh, the privacy laws throughout the United States, including the CCPA and as amended by CPRA, the other state laws the sector, sector specific laws, um, along with general privacy management issues, among other things. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's not, it's per se where the IBCIPP US exam is not sufficient to cover the cyber side as well. It's, it's not just privacy. Uh, second of all, although I don't think the IAPP system should be an exclusive mechanism for getting certified in California for a privacy specialization, I do think it should at least be an alternative avenue. And we could talk, of course, about number of years of experience necessary, what other conditions should be, but I think that should at least be considered as an alternative path, not the exclusive path. Um, the third point is, 
I think maybe with other specializations for a particular state bar, um, whether it's admiralty or otherwise, if it's for the state bar, there's often a very much focus on what are the laws in this particular state um, when you're probably taking an exam to get the specialization, because a lot of practice areas are very state specific and some attorneys may never venture out and practice in an area of law other than in California for other specializations. For example, they might not practice regarding Texas law or Tennessee law, et cetera. Privacy and cyber are very different, um, those two buckets of specialization. I don't think anybody can really practice privacy law as a privacy attorney or a cyber attorney by saying, I only do California law, period. Um, it's 99.9% .9 of the time if you represent a company or if you're uh, maybe on the public interest side and you're looking more broadly how to protect consumers in general, it's not, it, it's impossible almost to fragment that. A lot of companies are subject to all US laws. Um, they're multinational. Um, there's, if you're dealing with a cyber incident, um, you don't just say, I'm only going to handle the California side of an incident. You look at the reporting to see what residents of different states were impacted. There's a notification obligation. You have to harmonize it, et cetera. Same thing with a privacy compliance program. You don't just advise the company client here's your California compliance program. It's almost impossible to do it that way. There's five other states with privacy laws, more to come, and they're also subject to laws in other countries. So the reason why I bring that up is IEPP is an, as an organization, very reputable. It's been in this game for a long time, and they're trying to essentially harmonize all that, not only on a US level, but on a global level. Um, and they've already gone through this effort of developing an exam, the CIPP US exam, and similar exams in other in other regions like the E, the A, the C, et cetera, along with a privacy management exam and a and the CIPT exam for more technical minded folks. Um, and I, I just don't see the need to sort of start from scratch and unwind all this work that's been done throughout the years to try to develop this harmonized approach to like a, at least let's focus on US as applicable in California and to develop something from scratch if there's already been efforts at developing a standard that meets the everyday privacy and cyber professionals um, responsibilities and the knowledge base that they need for being a reputable professional in this field. Thank you, Arson. Uh, I had uh, two questions um, that um, I was thinking of um, as we were hearing from our guest speaker. Uh, the first uh, question that I had was uh, about the question about specialization. So uh, Janelle or Adrian, I don't know if you can answer this now or if we can answer this uh, during, the, during the next meeting. Uh, the North Carolina speaker talked about how North Carolina, North Carolina is a little bit different than California, whether California lawyers are allowed to say we specialize versus uh, we cannot say we're certified specialists. Um, can, you, can you clarify that for us? Because um, I think one of the reasons why we are proposing, the CLA proposed to create a legal specialty in privacy is because California licensed attorneys currently do not have the option um, to say we're a specialist in privacy law uh, because of the California bar rules. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right. So um, is that a question that you can clarify in terms of the limitations on how to present yourself as a privacy law specialist, specialist in California? Gene, I don't know if you're looking for the, the specific rule. I don't, I don't remember the, the rule off the top of my head, but okay. so California licensees, uh, they cannot say they are a certified specialist unless they're certified by the State Bar of California or certified by one of the State Bar accredited organizations. Uh, licensees can say that they are certified in an area. They can say that they specialize in an area, but they can't use those two terms together. So it's, it's, okay. it's, it's using the term certified and specialist together um, that they're not allowed to do. Got it. So kind of going back to what Arson was talking about in terms of IPP. Um, so if we have an IPP certification, which is CIPP, um, one of the CIPPs um, that, that IPP offers, can we say that we have a CIPP? So it's a certification that you have that's offered by another organization if you're a California licensed attorney. Uh, I think that's more of a, maybe an, an I don't know, Gene, if you if you know the appropriate answer, but I think it goes back to so 
since they are not a state bar accredited organization, someone certified by the C, uh, by the IAPP, if they're a California licensee, they cannot mm -hmm. say that they are a certified specialist in privacy law. Got it. But you can say that I have a CIPP, but I'm not a certified specialist in privacy. Yeah. Yeah. It's rule of professional conduct rule 7.4 in case Thank anybody um, needs the reference. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, it might be helpful. I thought it might be helpful just to kind of um, uh, level set, you know, what what is the purpose of this legal specialization? You know, who are who is the audience? You know, who who are the the attorneys who are licensed to practice in California that will want to uh, be taking advantage of the specialization and will benefit? That was one of the questions. Um, you know, in terms of benefiting the licensees, um, how this specialization would benefit. Second question that I came up with um, with the the North Carolina guest speaker was the approval process. And um, there was really helpful discussion uh, presentation by him about um, how this idea came about. It was a proposal by one attorney, and then it kind of went through the process. You know, how do you go about uh, certifying? How about how do you go about establishing a certification? And this group had we have not yet had that presentation. Um, I know that we had asked that question uh, for the the state bar, Janelle and um, Adrian staff to present. So maybe that's something that we can discuss at the next meeting. Um, because we have not yet talked about what happens next, you know, what happens after this consulting group presents the materials to go to CBLS. So I would just say um, that that is something that we will be discussing, uh, but it is not on the agenda for today. So I just wanted to raise that as potentially a, an agenda item for the next meeting. Uh, for the purpose for this meeting, um, I believe we're, I'm trying to at least uh, keep to the time that we had said, which is uh, that the meeting should adjourn by 2 p.m. So we would like to, uh, to take a quick break, 30-minute um, break, and we'll be back at 12.45. Um, I would like to remind everyone in the consulting group that uh, for today's purpose and for the next meeting, between today's meeting and the next meeting, um, there was a lot of discussion uh, by the present by the presenter to, and also uh, based on some of the questions about the certification process, which I know is very exciting. Uh, but please uh, be mindful that the assessment question that we have at hand and the materials that we're putting together between now and the next meeting is focused on the two assessment questions that we presented at the at the top of the hour. Is there sufficient need and interest to create a privacy law specialty? And is the area sufficiently defined to create a useful specialization? Those are the questions that we need to answer at this juncture. And we are not even going to start talking about the certification process until the CBLS has decided that we have answered those two questions sufficiently. So please focus, I would say, uh, thinking about when we come back, uh, we'll be asking to think about the six questions that we asked, that the State Bar asked us to consider about the impact on the business and the public, impact on the, the benefit to the public, the bar, and the licensees. Please think about how we're going to go about answering those questions based on the findings that, that, uh, that we are proposing to put together. And if you are, uh, what we would love to hear from the group when we come back from the break is which of those topics you would like to help prepare the materials. And that again includes the scope, right? So there was a lot of discussion about, you know, should it include information security, for example, you know, other states are looking at IPP and um, the ABA has certified IP. So, those are all good questions that can be embedded within the findings, the very last slide in 3B, agenda and 3B. So please take a look at it. We'll come back in 30 minutes at 1245 and we'll be looking for volunteers. Um, and we are really looking for, I would say one to two persons for each of those topics, uh, because um, I think, is, is the, could you remind me what the rule is? Uh, we cannot have more than three people work on a particular topic together. Is that right? So it has to be one to two people. Take a look at the list of findings that we are preparing. Some of these uh, materials are a finite universe. So for example, um, legislatures with privacy focus, that is a finite answer. Privacy law today, not a finite answer, right? And so I would say some of these questions, we probably only need one person. Um, the questions that require a little bit more um, you know, exchange and collaboration, we will be looking for two. Uh, so please kind of think about what your topic, your 
first choice, second choice, third choice topics would be uh, to volunteer to prepare the materials for the next meeting. Okay. Any questions on what we'll be doing at the next uh, part of this open meeting? If not, we will break and we'll see you at 12. Before you break, I saw oh. a hand. I don't, I don't want to dismiss. I'm sorry. Hand. Did I miss this hand? Yeah. I don't remember who it was. I think it was me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, I had a comment on the previous take about IAPP. It sounds like the distinction between that certification and where we may plug a need is that IAPP, I think, is fairly expensive and may not be something that is, you know, pocket friendly for a lot of young attorneys. And so a specialization that perhaps we may create might be helpful um, for younger attorneys or nonprofit attorneys that still want to specialize in privacy law, but don't quite have the backing of an employer to pay for that kind of certification. That's all. That's that's exactly right. Um, so, Smitha, again, I would um, remind the consulting group to, to think about how to prepare the materials that would answer uh, the two questions. You know, is there a sufficient need and interest and is there a sufficiently defined area, right? So to your comment about, you know, for example, let's say the cost, um, I think what would be helpful is to to talk about the cost and maybe comparing, you know, this uh, specialization versus um, another certification in terms of is there a need and interest for a privacy law specialization that is at a lower, lower cost. So if we are able to provide materials that um, that answer uh, the questions from the safe bar, I think that would be the most effective. So kind of think about any, uh, and you know, I, I kind of see us going towards the certification question, right? So I would say to try to stay away from kind of thinking about what the certification process looks like, but really kind of think about, is there sufficient need and interest for a privacy law specialization in California? Really kind of frame, you know, our materials and our presentation to talk about the need and interest, okay? All right, we're going to break now uh, for 25 minutes. I'll come back um, here. So we're going to stop the recording and we'll open for the meeting again at 1245. Recording off. So recording off. All right, we are back in the open session. Thanks very much for joining us again. Um, so we're going to uh, start discussing the city agenda item three B discussion regarding to regarding the the def, def, regarding the defining of the next steps for the privacy law group. So we're going to be uh, talking about um, these questions that the state bar has asked us to answer. Please keep that in mind uh, while we are discussing the findings, the materials that we will be pulling together, which is in the next slide. So if you can go to the next slide. So uh, these are uh, draft findings, and uh, you know we have asked the consulting group to take a look at um, how would we go about answering the need and interest question and the privacy law as a defined area question. And these are the materials that um, that we believe um, the state bar would uh, find helpful in finding. Yes, there is need and interest uh, for a privacy law specialization, and yes, privacy law is a defined area of law. So, so we're going to be talking about a little over an hour here, um, and. Um, to kind of get the consulting group's feedback on which of these topics uh, they would like to work on in polling. And uh, before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, the consulting group, are there any additional materials that, um, that you would like to, uh, to suggest that we pull together as a group to be responsive to those two questions, the assessment questions? We'll start with that. And if we don't have any additional materials, findings that we will pull, then we'll go ahead and start um, getting the volunteers and assigning each of these materials to one or two of you so that we have kind of an equal distribution 
of work, hopefully, um, and um, and everyone is is actively involved in gathering the materials for us. I'm trying to see if we have any show of hand, suggestions for any other materials. I'm not. I see Hillary has her hand oh, up. Hillary, okay. Hi, Hillary. Hi. So I actually have a question, and um, and that might inform. So when we say legislatures with a privacy focus, what exactly do we mean? Do we mean legislatures that maybe have a committee that's focused on privacy law? Is there? Yeah. Um, so maybe a good question. And yeah. um, I think I was uh, kind of rushing through these because I, we had a guest speaker. So we're, uh, we're happy to kind of think through what uh, what Ryan and I um, initially and the staff were thinking about when we kind of proposed these as findings. findings. So the legislature is responsive to the question about, again, is privacy law a defined area of the law? So mm -hmm. the state bar is interested in taking a look at what does it mean uh, to have privacy privacy law, right? So we heard from Ryan with the presentation earlier, uh, you know, so we thought that one of the ways uh, to show that privacy law is a defined area of law is that there are committees or subcommittees, tax forces, etc. That's the way I would think about it. I don't think there's to say committee. Um, so for example, in California, there is the Senate Judiciary Committee, but in the purpose and the mission of the Senate Judiciary Committee, it spells out clearly that privacy is in scope for their work, right? So although privacy is not in the name, it's the Judiciary Committee, privacy is clearly an area that the Senate Judiciary Committee works on and the Senate Judiciary Committee for California actively works on, um, on legislation focused on privacy. So that's kind of an example that we had. And so um, California has, uh, like I said, the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Assembly that's focused on privacy. But I was thinking to some of uh, the the comments uh, earlier, uh, you know, I, 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 my personal uh, thinking is that it should not be limited. Our, our presentation to California should not be limited to the California legislature. Um, I would have th uh, thought that we can talk really about the, you know, all of the legislatures in the United States. And maybe the question is even outside of the United States, but that's really kind of the material that we're hoping um, one or two of you uh, would present back um, to our, our uh, group meeting. You know, what is the scope? Um, is that, are we talking about California only? Are we talking about all US 50 states? Um, should we care about legislatures um, outside of the United States that are actively um, uh, establishing laws in privacy? Um, so that would be up to the person who works on that particular research topic. Does that answer your question, Hillary? Okay. Um, I think I saw Oliver first and then Smita. I don't know if I got that right. So Oliver? Hey, Juwan, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting me down to either take on this task or partner with someone else, and I'd be interested in the other states with privacy law specializations and reporting back. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to take notes here, but Adrian and Janelle, please uh, help me take notes as well, because uh, I want to make sure that my, my notes are accurate. So I have Oliver raising his hand for the first one. So I'm just going to put numbers next to them just so that we can keep them organized. So I believe we got five on the, the need and interest, and we got three on the privacy law as a defined area of law. So we got number one topic on the left-hand side, Oliver. And do you have, <laughs> oh my goodness, now I, uh oh, Janelle, I'm gonna need help um, in determining uh, who raised their hand first. Um, I know Smita is next, and then uh, Janelle, please keep an eye on um, the order which which we had the, the hands being raised. Smita? Sure. <clears throat> My question was on law schools with privacy law curriculum. I am so uh, again. Are we thinking of law schools nationally with privacy law curriculum? Right outside of the uh, outside of just California, right? Yeah, good question. Um, I would say again, you know, the person who is pre presenting the materials, I think it's up to you. Um, and I think we are really kind of the state bar is asking for this consulting group to to respond to the question of, you know, is this a defined area of the law? Mm -hmm. So I think it would be up to the person who is pulling uh, the materials to say, you know, here is a list of law schools in California or outside of California. And because of this material, we think that, you know, this is an, a defined area of law. So okay, I can do that one. you can do that one. Okay. 
So that would be the third topic on the defined area of law. I have Smitha and Janelle uh, and Jan, did you get a chance to uh, get the speaker's order? If you can help me out. Hey, Suze hey. Martinez. Yeah, hi, I'd like to join Smita on that topic, the law school privacy question. law curriculum. Yes. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah, so for now, why don't we just, again, let's go with the first choice. Uh, why don't we just say, you know, what your first choice is, and then maybe after we kind of have, you know, how many hands are raised for each topic, we can decide if we need to kind of make some adjustments. Okay, so that would be my first choice. All right, Jesus, on the third topic for the defined area of law. Hillary? Um, I guess my first choice would be other states with privacy law specializations. So now we have Hillary and Oliver on the first topic on the left, need an interest. Lindsay? Oh, and could you uh, rate and lower your hand if we have addressed your question or comment? Okay, Lindsay. Yeah, I was I was of course going to volunteer for the law schools with pr privacy law curriculum. I think that looks to be full. Um, my uh, second choice would be um, enforcement actions with privacy focus. Okay, so I got Lindsay on the enforcement action, um, and. So um, in terms of next steps, uh, yes, please tell us kind of what your first choice and what your second choice is. And then after we get everyone kind of volunteered for each of these, I think we can make adjustments, you know, depending on kind of what, what our areas of expertise is and, and interest uh, personally on these topics. Um, having said that, um, even if you are not the first drafter for this topic, um, at the next meeting, we'll be able to discuss it. So I will say um, that, you know, if you are the, the first or the second person putting together the material um, the rest of the consulting group will have a chance to opine on the materials presented by each member at the next meeting. So, Lindsay, if you end up not uh, being the first drafter on the law schools, um, you, we will absolutely would like to hear from you on that topic. Okay, keeping that in mind, uh, who is our next uh, speaker? Robert. Yeah, so just a point of the question is the difference between states with privacy law specializations and bar associations with a privacy specialty. Yeah, so, good question. Um, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because because I'm interested. I was going to say the bar associations because being a non-attorney, I don't want to get too deep into the le legal matters of privacy law today and whatnot. But, um, you know, what is the difference between the two? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, the privacy law specialization is the, the specific legal specialty that our North Carolina speaker talked about. So there is, um, there are, I, I, I want to say handful, but it's actually a lot more than handful. So there are a number of states that have a privacy law specialization. So North right. Carolina being the first, as our speaker talked about. And so that is actually a finite universe, right? Uh, we have a number of states that already have have decided either to create their own certification standards or have adopted the IPP, uh, CIPP, and uh, the ABA um, approved process as creating a specialty. So I would say number one is actually a finite universe in terms of research. The second one um, would be um, a little bit more open. Um, it's not a finite universe because it does require just looking at the different bar associations. Um, the question is, um, is there sufficient need and interest in privacy specialty at the bar association level? So for example, I mentioned the California Lawyers Association, which are the sections to the California State Bar, uh, we just established the privacy law section in 2020. So the California State Bar, um, uh, California Lawyers Association, which is the, which is the sections of the state bar, uh, we have a separate privacy law section. But um, I would say that it's not just bar associations with sections, right? Because there are committees, there are task forces, there are subcommittees. Uh, so, you know, it would really, if this is something that you would be interested in, Robert, it would be to take a look at some of the bar associations uh, at the state level. So I looked at Cal New York, for example, just to kind of see what New York bar does. 
but also taking a look at a couple of more local uh, bar associations like the Bar Association of San Francisco or Orange County Bar Association. Um, you know, those are the ones that, that come to mind. So there are local um, county or city bar associations. There's also minority bar associations that have created privacy specialty. So I don't think it has to be an exhaustive list. Um, and I, I really, this is an exercise of, is there sufficient number of bar associations that show that there is a need and interest in a privacy specialty? Does that make sense? Yeah, so th you can put me down for that one. All right. Who's next? Paul? Hi, um, I will be interested either in the first in the first topic, the states with privacy or specializations, or the second one, the bar associations with uh, privacy specialty. Okay, I'm putting you down for those two, Paul, but having said that, I am probably going to ask you to move <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. um, because I think the first two questions are pretty limited in universe. Um, I, I will just you know make a plea uh, to this group. The California privacy cases, that's that's a pretty meaty subject. Um, I think the enforcement, I, so California privacy cases, that's we're talking about um, litigation. So if there are any litigators in this group, please help us define what does it mean to have a California privacy case? Are we talking about CCPA cases only, for example, right? Or do we care about you know, ECPA cases, um, invasion of privacy cases? Do we care about data breach cases? So I think California privacy cases is a pretty meaty subject. Um, enforcement <laughs> actions. Again, a pretty meaty subject. So I'm really glad that Lindsay um, had volunteered to help with that because that is to really have a, a you know thought on leadership on who are the agencies um, that are uh, that are bringing enforcement actions with privacy privacy law today. Those are that is again a pretty meaty subject. And Ryan got us a good start. Um, those are the ones that I think are that really kind of require a lot of focus. I think the other topics have a pretty finite universe. And I don't think we need more than one person. That would be my personal um, suggestion. So for now, Paul, uh, we're going to put you down as um, as topic one and two, but please think about another topic that you could help on. Um, if we don't get a volunteer for one of the other topics, we're going to start kind of keeping this meeting open until we do. <laughs> until 2 p.m. <laughs> All right. Who's the next speaker? Michael? I know. Um, originally, I was going to say bar association with privacy specialty because I love bar associations. I'm on ABA, CLA, and all that stuff. Um, but I also will put myself down for public interest and advocacy groups with privacy focus. That's great. So only because, Michael, nobody has said yes to number five, I'm going to put you down as five first on the public interest groups. Okay, who's next? Arson? Arson? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I can cover privacy law today. Okay. Did we get all of the hands? And Hillary. Ah, uh, Hillary. So I will switch knowing that other states with privacy specializations is finite and do California privacy cases. Oh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. All right. So Paul, <laughs> I'm looking at my, my notes. It looks like legislatures with privacy focus, we don't have any volunteers. So unless uh, one of the group members really excited to do that, Paul, could we help? Uh, could we get your help with that? Um, so the number of legislatures um, that have a privacy focus. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, you know, you know, just to clarify, what do you mean by legislatures? Just to be sure we're on the same page. 
much. Yeah, sure. So legislature is a lawmaking body. So mm-hmm. looking at California, that would be the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Assembly um, that does rule that that does make um, that makes laws in the area of privacy. So um, the first question for you, uh, for anybody who is preparing materials for the legislatures, would be, what are the legislatures that are enacting laws uh, that have a privacy focus? Um, and uh, do we uh, do we have committees, uh, task forces, um, subcommittees, um, and, uh, and and basically bodies of the legislatures that seem to have a focus in enacting laws in privacy? So it would be up to you to define. Uh, would that be California? Would that be the U.S. fifty states? Um, I think that's probably a good place to start taking a look at: Is there a committee that's focused on enacting privacy laws in each of the states in the in the fifty states? And then maybe a handful of examples that are outside the U.S. Um, really, the whole point of this question is: Is privacy law a defined area of law? And if you take a look at the number of legislatures that have either passed privacy laws or have a committee that's looking to to debate and to pass privacy laws, uh, I think that would be responsive to this question. Okay, so the, um, so my question was more in relation to do we need to identify the specific uh, uh, committees which are specifically focused on privacy or can they have a broader focus and touch on privacy as well? Yeah, that's, I mean, I think, again, this will be up to the consulting group. I think each of us kind of bring a different perspective to this. So um, Mm -hmm. I think we're leaving it, you know, kind of open for you to interpret. But to to think about, um, I think a good place to start is to say, here is a number of committees and task forces that are focused in privacy at the different 50 state legislatures. That's a good place to start. But to your point, Paul, I agree with you. I I think, um, you know, even if like the Senate, right? In California, the mm-hmm. Senate does not have a privacy committee, but the Senate Judiciary Committee makes mm-hmm. it really clear in their mission statement that they will enact privacy laws. And it's their role uh, within the California Senate to pass, um, to debate and to pass uh, laws focused on privacy. So I would not limit to mm-hmm. the list of committees. I would uh, to take a, take a look at um, if there is enough evidence that you can present to the bar that privacy law is a defined area of law by looking at the legislatures. You up up to it? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Do we have any other consulting uh, group members that have wanted to volunteer for one of these topics and did not get a chance to? Okay, Uh, go ahead. Did So Yun? I, I, I see that she joined late. Hi. Yeah. No, I've been on um, oh, okay. since, uh, I don't know, but earlier. Um, I didn't volunteer because I'm kind of open to, <laughs> I, you know, my understanding is right now is to express a preference. You know, really, do you want to here to help if you have like an open slot? Um, I will protest if it's something completely. <laughs> something that I hate, sorry. But um, otherwise, you know, um, yeah, it seems like you have someone on everything. So if there's an area you need to double up on some, some you know, something just like, yeah, slot me in. Thank you so much for, for being so flexible. So um, my, my take on this would be that um, the cases uh, enforcement actions or the privacy law today, those are the three topics that we might need uh, a, a second person to help. Uh, mm-hmm. We do have Smita, Jesus, and uh, Smita and Jesus, the two, on the law schools with privacy law curriculum. So uh, I might also ask, um, you know, either Smita or Jesus um, to move to a different topic so that we have two um, uh, prepared um, materials to Again, um, let me just clarify. If you are doubled up with another person, what that means is that you can work with that person. Um, so because of the Begley Clean I, um, rule, we cannot have a group that's bigger than three. But if you are doubled up, the, the two of you can work together. You can consult, you can exchange ideas, and hopefully come back in a collaborative way. So um, 
I would say, Soyan, um, would you like to work on cases uh, or enforcement actions or privacy law today? Um, you know, I think, uh, I mean, either of those three are fine. Um, I think I can also help with the cases and enforcement actions because it seems like it's more targeted. Um, so if it's helpful to do either of those, then um, yeah. Okay, so Soyeon is being flexible uh, to help either Hillary or Lindsay on the cases or the enforcement actions. Then let me ask Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, you uh, volunteer to help with the law schools, but um, I think Smith has got it. <laughs> so um, Jesus, uh, are you, uh, would you have more um, experience or expertise in looking at the cases, the litigation um, aspect of it, or the regulatory enforcement actions, or uh, a, a landscape of privacy law today presentation. The landscape of uh, privacy law today. Okay, then um, I think Jesus is offering to work with Arson on the privacy law today. So that leaves Soyan to help either Hillary or Lindsay. So Hillary or Lindsay, who would like Soyan's help? <laughs> would love to have you. <laughs> All right. I think Lindsay spoke first. So unless Hillary is protesting. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. All right. Uh, having said that, uh, Ryan and I will be helping you. So uh, we will be checking in uh, to help you uh, because we will hopefully be able to um, make the materials consistent, uh, you know, throughout all of the topics. So we can check in with you, um, I think, that is allowed uh, within the rules. Um, so uh, you are not going to be alone, uh, Hillary. Uh, we'll be checking in on you to make sure that the materials that we put together are presented in a way that's consistent, uh, because we're going to be putting this all together in one package for the bar to consider. And please, um, I would like to just remind everyone, I'm so glad that this meeting is recorded because I'm probably gonna be watching it uh, maybe over and over again. Uh, there, were, um, there was a lot of information provided um, during the staff report in terms of the strategic plan. Please keep the strategic plan of the, the state bar in mind. Uh, please keep in mind the assessment questions. These are the questions that we are asked to answer. So uh, please keep your materials uh, you know, pointed to answering those two assessment questions, um, which is need and interest. Is there a need and interest for privacy and uh, privacy law specialization? And is privacy law a sufficiently defined area of the law that would warrant creating a specialization? So please keep those assessment questions in mind. Um, as you are pulling the materials together. And if you have any questions about, um, you know, whether the scope that you're looking at is correct or the materials that you're putting together um, is the right material, if you want to just chat with one of us, uh, Ryan and I are available. Um, so we'll be uh, sending a note to each of you to open um, that line of communication uh, to work on uh, between now and the next meeting. So again, we are working towards building that the larger package that will be presented to CBLS. Any other, oh, I see Paul has a hand up. Um, yeah, what is the time frame to submit uh, the response to the, uh, the research? Yeah, good question. Um, I know that there was a tentative uh, meeting date, um, Adrian, that you were thinking of, Adrian and Janelle. Uh, can we tell them the date that we're thinking of now? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm seeing a uh, head nodding. So uh, June 1 is the date that uh, the state bar would like us to meet um, at the, the next time. What that means is for each of you by April 24th, so about a month from now, the, the materials that you are pulling together to answer each of these questions will be due. So by then, uh, please send to us um, the materials I would say, you know, probably PowerPoint is probably best. So PowerPoint that kind of summarizes the same way that Ryan and I summarize kind of the tasking, you know, up to now. So put in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, the answers to the questions that you are responsible for by April 24, send that to Adrian and, and Janelle. Uh, you're welcome to copy Ryan and me, but really it's Janelle and Adrian that are going to be putting it together. So please make sure that the two of them are copied. Um, Ryan and I can be optional. 
So April 24 is a deadline for the materials. We'll continue to work with the staff, uh, Major and Janelle will pull all of the materials from the, the group and that will be sent back out to the group um, in terms of the, the larger presentation, uh, you know, the same way that this uh, meeting was sent out. So you will see the agenda being posted and you'll see the written materials and the supporting materials uh, being posted uh, for the public um, to, to review uh, accordance with the rules, and the procedures for announcing the public meeting. So April 24 for the deliverables due, June 1 for the next uh, public open meeting. Any other questions? Oh, just a quick comment, mm -hmm. um, not to criticize, but um, we can have people more than three or more for groups for Berkeley Keen. It just becomes unruly at that point with the uh, notice requirements of 10 days in the fence. I'm sorry, say that again? Sorry, oh, Michael, I think what you're trying to, so just for those who are not familiar with Bagley Keene, there are requirements to have um, publicly noticed meetings. And so it is possible for more than two members to meet, um, but that requires publicly posting. But Michael, I think what we're trying to accomplish yeah. is allowing um, these working groups to meet and do work outside of notice oh, meetings. Oh, I know, so, I know. Okay. I'm just- Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, thank you. I just want to um, not be that person, but to bring up it's we could technically have it. It's not prohibited by Bagley Keen. It's just the um, requirements of Bagley Keen makes it costly prohibitive and unruly for a, an assignment like this. Correct. So uh, for for now, uh, what we are proposing is to work in small groups, one to two uh, persons, and for the staff to pull the materials together, and we will discuss it um, as a group um, at our next meeting in Gen 1. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to note, so we do have one member, unfortunately, who wasn't able to make it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to tentatively assign them something, and then yeah. we'll call them the recording, and then um, so that they get at least get started um I don't know your thoughts that's true I think Mar Maria right so Maria was not able to attend um so I think if we were to um just take a look at the the topics that perhaps you know could be benefited maybe that's Hillary right because Hillary I think probably wanted a second person yeah so, probably uh, yeah so why don't we tentatively have, thank you, Adrian, for reminding me. So uh, Mar uh, Mariah uh, was not able to attend. Um, so we'll see if Mariah could help Hillary with um, the privacy cases topic. Okay, is everyone clear in terms of what we are looking for? We're looking for a high level uh, summary uh, presentation that is ready to go to the bar. So, you know, here is how we um, at, at the consulting group level would present to the bar. So for example, other states with privacy law specialization, if that's your topic, um, that's for Oliver. So Oliver, you're gonna come uh, with the materials at the next meeting um, by April 24, send the slides that says, here's a list of the other states that have privacy law specializations, right? Here's other states and here is, here is the list of application requirements, perhaps. That's the way I would look at it, um, to take a look at what states, the number of states that already have privacy law specializations and what do those states require um, there was some debate uh, already, um, some discussion already about whether we go with the IPP um, ABA route or do we do something different. So I think that would be helpful, uh, but please, again, uh, this is an exercise to talk about the need and the interest. So please prepare the materials to talk about how each of these materials answer the question asked, the assessment questions, and keeping in mind um, the, the slide before this, the impact on California, the six questions, how do each of these topics help us answer this question about you know, whether it is represented by attorneys or per se, and how does this impact the public? How does it impact the businesses? How does this benefit the public, the licensees, and the, the state bar's mission? Please keep in mind these six questions as you are pulling the materials, keeping the materials limited to those two questions, the assessment questions, and um, you know, that way we can prepare the materials that are gonna go to the CBLS. And after the CBLS approves our materials to go forward, we will then be uh, discussing the certification standards. I see two hands up, Hillary. Okay. 
Yeah, will we be given a template for the PowerPoint um, just so to make it easier for us when we're putting it together, make sure we're actually putting it together in a way that will be useful and we won't have to yeah. work. Really good question. I asked the same question to Janelle, and um, I think the state bar's preference would be for you to create your own slides and we will put it together into the state bar format. Uh, please keep in mind that the slides, you know, do not have to be very fancy. Um, if you are pulling in, you know, graphics and whatnot, or if, I don't know if you're uh, planning to do any uh, fancy designs. If you are, um, just uh, let Janelle or Adrian know uh, so that they can start working with you, any kind of special formatting. But otherwise, as you see here, the slides are pretty basic. Mm -hmm. um, it's text-based, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, as you're pulling this material, keep, uh, it's perfectly fine I would say to have like an appendix so you can say here are the slides here are the main points that we want to present but here are you know pdf copies here are some reports maybe so it would be fine to append uh, whatever materials you're pulling um, as as additional uh, material supporting materials to the the powerpoint presentation okay I see two more questions um, I don't know if it was Michael first or Oliver Oliver uh, just really quickly, um, Hillary and I were aligned in our thinking. Uh, rather than the question, I was going to make the recommendation if we could maybe have the template that we're looking for, but it sounds like that's not an option with those six questions already front loaded so that we can be consistent in our presentation and our findings. So that's all that I was going to say. Thank you. We can send it. We can send a couple slides that have the, the two questions and then those, those two assessment questions. Okay. Thank that's you so much, problem. and that would be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, my quick comment is, um, if we make your own custom PowerPoints for presentations, I uh, just want to say, make sure it's um, accessible uh, in terms of high contrast, clarity, and not too fancy animations and whatnot. That has to be ultimately removed if it's for the public uh, for accessibility reasons. Um, and then the second thing, just for a quick little tidbit, uh, whenever someone raises their hand, it always goes in chronological order. So wow. you can see the first hand <laughs> order and count that down. And it, um, the administrator for this has to uh, either lower the hand or the person has to lower the hand to be removed. So you then move on to the next in line. Thank you, Michael, for both of your comments. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, we really look forward to working with you. Thank you for your time. Uh, this concludes all open session items. There are no closed session items on today's agenda. I hereby adjourn today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please Bye. stop recording.